Elix 2 is the aptly named sequel to Elix, an open-world action-adventure RPG from German developer Piranha Bytes, who are previously known for their work on the Gothic and Risen trilogies. As a series, Elix blends science fiction, fantasy, and post-apocalypse themes by way of a magical substance known as Elix, which was on a comet that struck the fictional planet of Magalon some 160 years ago, leaving the survivors to band together into different factions that would harness the power of Elix in different ways, some using it to fuel advanced technologies, others using it to draw inert magical energy from the Earth, and others using it as a psychoactive drug to stimulate their physical and mental prowess. You play as Jax, a former ALB commander who, in the first game, was betrayed by his order and worked to stop the ALB's destructive conquest to harvest all Elix from the planet. Elix 2 picks up several years after the first game's conclusion and once again sees Jax working to unite the factions to fight off an enemy threat, this time in the form of an alien invasion force who actually sent the comet to Magalon as a means to terraform the planet in advance of their arrival. Just like Elix 1, the core gameplay revolves around exploring a relatively large map searching for loot and hidden secrets, battling enemies and completing side quests, interacting with factions and companion characters to build your reputation with them, and upgrading your character with stronger equipment and new skills as you level up, all while progressing through a main questline that spans four chapters of storytelling. For the most part, Elix 2 operates like a typical sequel by sticking to the familiar formula of the first game while attempting to polish and improve upon some of its jagged rough edges. Many of these improvements are a welcome addition that add newfound fluidity and expanded functionality to an already satisfying, if a bit janky, gameplay experience, but unfortunately not all of the changes are uniform improvements. In fact, some of them could be seen as straight downgrades compared to how similar things were handled in the first game, while other choices come off as a bit puzzling, to say the least. After all, a sequel is supposed to be an opportunity to provide the same type of gameplay experience in a new and improved package. Since the bulk of the groundwork should have already been laid in the first game, the developer should have more opportunity to focus on the finer details they might not have had the time or resources to work on the first time around, which is arguably where Elix 1 struggled the most. Despite being pretty solid in many regards, with a lot of impressive heart and ambition, it was still marred by lackluster technical execution as a result of the developer's limited budget and manpower. It's like they had a good game on their hands but just needed more time to flesh out their ideas, playtest everything, and polish it up. So for Elix 2, it seemed like all they really needed to do was copy over everything from Elix 1 and just fix or otherwise tweak the stuff that didn't work right, expand on the gameplay with some new mechanics and features, and then put it all in a new map and story, and I'm sure many people would have been happy with the end result. After all, that's basically what they did with Gothic 2, which is widely considered to be their best game ever created, and certainly their best sequel. A big part of the reason that game worked so well is that it was a direct extension of Gothic 1 that built directly on top of the successful foundation of the first game, while still retaining pretty much everything that made the original Gothic so beloved in the first place. That's not quite what they did with Elix 2. It's still basically the same gameplay experience, and indeed it sticks much closer to the established formula of its predecessor than, say, Gothic 3 or Risen 2, but instead of building off of the existing foundation of Elix 1, like remodeling or renovating an existing house, it's like they built an entirely new house from scratch with blueprints that were retroactively modeled after the original one. Nearly every design element has been completely recreated with some kind of subtle or, in some cases, major twist put on it, and with every new recreation and new twist comes new opportunity to mess something up or stray from the tenets that made the first game so compelling in the first place, while also leaving them with, I presume, less time to work on fleshing everything out properly and fine-tuning the smaller details, which are some of the main areas of weakness that Elix 2 needed to improve upon from the first game, which they didn't entirely deliver on with the sequel. To be fair, Elix 2 makes tremendous improvements to many critical aspects that turned many people off from the first game. Namely, the new movement scheme and jetpack controls make simply moving around the world a lot less cumbersome and awkward, and therefore much more satisfying this time around. And the new changes to the combat system with regards to its animations, hitboxes, and auto-targeting systems make it feel much more responsive and a lot less clunky than it did in Elix 1. This is, of course, in addition to other changes like improved functionality with different interface options and a much less punishing difficulty curve, all of which combine to make Elix 2 feel decidedly less janky and more accessible than its predecessor. Other things like the faction quests and the way the game reacts to your actions are really well done, being some of the best that have ever been done in a Piranha Bytes game. But then it seems like Elix 2 also lost a little bit of the first game's creative spark along the way, where the sequel doesn't seem to have as much charm or personality as the first one. A lot of this can be seen with the way certain mechanics have been streamlined, thus eliminating some of the first game's mechanical depth and fun variety of content. 
but it also extends to the much more homogenous world design and the fact that so many recurring elements from the first game, like certain landscapes, factions, and characters, are all decidedly less interesting than they were originally. This, combined with a really lackluster main quest line, some nonsensical storytelling, and Piranha Bytes' usual lack of polish leave Elix 2 feeling like more of a mixed bag of good, bad, and mediocre, where the biggest disappointment isn't so much the game itself, but all the missed potential it had to improve on the original game and finally grant us another Piranha Bytes sequel that would compete with Gothic 2. Elix 2 is no Gothic 2, unfortunately, but by the same token it's no Gothic 3 or Risen 2 either, so ultimately I can't be too upset about it, but it's still disappointing that it's still not as good as it could've or maybe should've been. The sequel continues on the premise that was set up by the first game's conclusion, which foreshadowed the impending arrival of an extraterrestrial collective, later revealed in Elix 2 to be called Sky Ants, who would threaten to take over all life on the planet, thus setting up Jax's mission to prepare the world for their arrival. The story then flashes forward several years with a few trailer montages, slideshow narrations, and dialogue sequences filling in the gaps between Elix 1 and Elix 2, wherein Jax apparently tried, but failed, to get the factions to heed the alien threat and work together to plan against it. Discouraged by their lack of cooperation, Jax apparently gave up and went into exile while everyone else went about their own oblivious interests, until the day when the aliens finally arrive and Jax is once again thrust into action to save the world, thus kicking off the actual start of Elix 2 when Jax's home is destroyed and he gets infected by an alien creature. He's subsequently rescued and nursed back to health by Adam Dawkins, the hybrid from Elix 1, now removed from the machine in the ALB Directive, who's trying to establish a new faction that he calls the Sixth Power to fight off the aliens. From there, the story deals with learning about the aliens' origins and their ultimate intentions, figuring out their weaknesses and how to beat them, and recruiting enough allies from the other factions to help take the fight to the aliens and drive them off the planet. Oh, and at some point between games, Jax and Kaya hooked up and had a kid together named Dex, who's apparently going to play some kind of important role in thwarting the aliens' plans. Right off the bat, there's questionable continuity issues with regards to important choices from Elix 1 not necessarily carrying over to Elix 2. Elix 1 offered what might be an unprecedented amount of player choices for a Piranha Bytes game, and instead of finding a clever way to account for those choices in the sequel, like, say, by importing save files or giving you a Witcher 3 style simulated save option to manually set critical outcomes from the first game, or even just by leaving the outcomes open-ended and allowing you to shape the narrative through your own dialogue choices, they just picked one option they considered canon for each decision or else ignored the decision completely. Every companion from Elix 1 makes a return in Elix 2, for example, except for the two whom you had the option to kill at the end of their quest line, and of course the one who sacrificed themselves as part of the main quest line. So it can be pretty disappointing if you are a big fan of characters like Doris or Arx and don't get to see them again in the sequel, when literally everyone else is back and you chose to let those two live previously. Even if you had chosen to kill them, their absence in the sequel isn't explained whatsoever. On the other hand, a major character like Sestek could be killed in the first game, as I did, if your cold value was too high to get the Alb Separatists to cooperate with you, and then he just inexplicably shows up in the sequel anyway as if he hadn't been previously murdered. The same goes for someone like Naira, who could potentially die in the aftermath of the assault on the domed city, who then not only shows up in Elix 2 as a companion, but is also a primary romance option. Likewise, it can be jarring if you killed the hybrid at the end of Elix 1 and then suddenly find him alive and well at the start of Elix 2, or if you chose to rejoin the ALB Directive and serve the hybrid only to be told that, no, you actually defeated the hybrid and ended the ALB's reign. Then there's the whole romance situation with Kaya and Nasty, where you might have preferred Nasty or in fact opted not to pursue a relationship with either one, only to find out that you've not only romanced Kaya but even procreated with her. I understand that it's difficult to plan for these types of variables and include dynamic outcomes for every possibility, and given Piranha Bytes' limited budget and manpower, it's maybe not reasonable for them to do so. But I still feel like these things could have been handled better so that getting into the sequel wouldn't be as awkward for someone like me who apparently made every choice differently from what the developer considers canon. Because in my case, it made the start of Elix 2 feel pretty off-putting when the game was effectively telling me that none of the decisions I made in the first game actually mattered and then flaunted it with so many blatant retcons to my own personal roleplaying. It's one thing for the game to say that circumstances changed after the first game so your specific outcome wouldn't actually matter, and then present the player with a fresh slate to work from, 
but it's another to retroactively force canonical outcomes from the first game on the player and then shove them down your throat by prominently featuring them on screen and throughout the recurring storyline of the sequel. Why, for instance, do the hybrid's fate and your relationship status with Kaya have to be treated as such prevalent, impactful storylines that dictate the entirety of the plot in Elix 2? Couldn't the story have been written in such a way that those outcomes would be more like secondary or tertiary details that could be more easily dismissed as inconsequential if their depiction in Elix 2 didn't match up with your outcomes from Elix 1, as opposed to being front and center from the very start of the game? The whole point of Dawkins being in the sequel is that he's the one trying to initiate the Sky and Resistance by way of the Sixth Power, and so that you can learn more about his backstory with the Comet and Elix, and thus a potential connection to the Sky Ends when he was with Infinite Skies. But it seems like he didn't need to be alive and present in the sequel for either of those two plot points to occur, as it could have easily been someone else leading the charge, and you could have learned more about Dawkins' backstory through other means than simply him telling you about it such as via more uncovered memoirs or other characters who somehow knew about it. There's also a later plot point about Jax's former connection to the hybrid with the ALB control chip, among other things, and how this potentially affects the Skyans' motives, but I'm not sure Dawkins really needed to be in the game for this revelation to work out either. The only thing his inclusion really brings to the equation is nagging doubt as to whether Dawkins has actually reformed from his ways as the hybrid and whether he's actually telling you the truth about his motives, thus setting the story up for some potential conflict later on. If he had to be in the game, then it seems like they could have eased him back in a little more gently by not having him show up until halfway through and make his appearance much more mysterious as to how he survived the encounter at the end of the first game and got to his present situation, so that his presence could feel like more of a surprise twist as opposed to a blatant retcon for certain people who got certain endings in the first game. Dex is likewise introduced in the story to serve as a MacGuffin for defeating the aliens due to his genetic link to Jax, except I'm not sure the story really needed to have him in it either. It's suggested that Dex has some kind of special ability to understand and control the Sky and technology, which will come into play later on when it comes to mounting your final assault. But the fact that he's your son doesn't really pay off in the story except for the emotional stakes involved with getting your son involved and putting him in danger. Which would be fine if Dex were woven into the story more prominently and made to be an empathetic character we could connect with, but the game sort of forgets about him for the bulk of the running time. He's introduced early on with a few special quests and interactions, and then he basically just sits around at the Bastion, the headquarters of the Sixth Faction, for the entire game doing absolutely nothing, save for one moment when he's mysteriously drawn to one of the alien structures while in a trance. So him miraculously coming to the rescue at the end of the game doesn't feel earned by the story because it never really built up to that point. The fact that he's your son may play an important role in explaining why he has these special abilities, but as far as I'm concerned, it could have been written in a different way where someone else, like, say, your adopted father, Wardek, had some kind of similar special ability to help out, which wouldn't require Jax to have reproduced off-screen with an optional romantic interest that certain players may never have shown any interest in and may not desire to have that special connection with in the sequel. As it is, jumping into Elix 2, suddenly having a kid who never existed in the first game and being told that you're supposed to care about him and having to reconcile a tattered relationship with Kaya that apparently happened between games while the game rushes to try to catch you up on the backstory between Dex, Jax, and Kaya is pretty awkward, in addition to being potentially wrong for your own personal continuity. The main point of the story is supposed to be fighting off the Sky and Invaders, but this feels underdeveloped too. The idea is that the aliens have suddenly arrived and started setting up some sort of dual-function terraforming machines slash genetic experimentation labs, called Formers in the game's terminology, that spew a new purple version of Elix called Dark Elix into the environment, which seems to be steadily converting the local flora and fauna into new corrupted versions that I guess are meant to be incompatible with normal life on the planet, and which supposedly threaten life as we know it if it continues to spread and take over the rest of the world. Except that no one really seems all that concerned about it, and the Sky Ends spend basically the entire game hanging out in their respective areas not really doing anything all that threatening. For the most part, you just get sporadic offhand comments from people along the lines of, boy, what's going on with those weird purple things? I sure hope it's not going to be a problem. And then you get a couple scripted events where Sky and enemies spawn in certain places for a main quest, but these two are pretty sparse and don't give the feeling like these alien invaders are really taking over the world or anything like that. It's not like in Gothic 2, for example, where the orcs have invaded the old Valley of Mines map and completely taken over everything. 
In that game, the entire map from Gothic 1 has become a hostile wasteland where the last bastion of humanity is up to its neck and orcs struggling to survive with little to no hope of ever escaping the orcs' unrelenting siege. You really get the feeling that this is a serious threat and that everyone here is in danger. Whereas the Skyans and Elix 2 feel like a curious nuisance happening somewhere off in the distance for pretty much the entire game, up until the final chapter. The only place where it ever feels like there might be some actual danger is the Alb's headquarters, which does suffer periodic attacks from the Skyans, but that by itself is not enough to really make it feel like there's some sort of impending doom in the main story that has to be prevented. Even when the main quest starts ramping up with more Skyan spawns and events, it always just feels like random incidental skirmishes here and there that aren't really motivated by any greater purpose. It's a classic case of being told there's some kind of great enemy threat that has to be stopped and not necessarily being shown as much and thus actually getting to feel it for yourself. Consequently, I never found the Skyans to be an interesting antagonist. Besides never seeing them really do anything all that menacing, they look kind of silly, and Jax even makes a stupid comment about how dumb the name Skyand is. When I first heard what you called yourselves, it sounded like Sky Ants. But you're not insects. So I could never take them seriously, and thus the whole story about stopping the Skyans was a non-motivating factor for me from the beginning. In the absence of a rising threat, the story throughout the first few chapters is filled with what I can only describe as pointless, speculative filler. There's not a lot of actual storytelling happening throughout the first couple of chapters, as it mostly consists of just gathering information on the Sky Ants, how their technology works, how Dark Elix mutates the biology of local wildlife, what the Sky Ants' motives might be, and so on. It certainly suggests that a good amount of thought went into the game's lore, but it's all conveyed exclusively by NPCs spouting minutes worth of verbal diarrhea at you. There are numerous quests where important characters send you out to collect samples or investigate sky and activity, wherein you basically just walk to an area and then stand there listening to them talk. Some of these quests are split up over five or six iterations where you do literally the exact same thing five or six different times and then listen to the characters talk about the next iterative bit of information about the selected topic and what this new discovery might mean five or six different times for each different character. I found it very difficult to care or even pay attention during this stage of the game, because so much of that dialogue just felt like meaningless babble that was only there to fill up space. Like when you're writing a paper in school and need to find a way to stretch the word count to meet the minimum requirement, so you just throw in a bunch of unnecessary wording and redundant phrases that don't add anything to the essay except to make it longer. This is no better exemplified than with the end of chapter monologues by Jax, where he asks an endless amount of hollow questions as if to make it seem like the story is actually going somewhere and that there's going to be some importance to all of this gibberish. But why do they even need them? If they change our planet to suit their needs, why would they need to adapt further? There must be more to this whole thing. I have to find out what the Skyans really want with our world, and everything in it. I finally reached the point where everyone else knows what I'm doing and what I stand for. I'm more confused than ever. Is the path the Skyans are on the right one? Could it be that striving for immortality, for the next rung on the evolutionary ladder, is really the way forward? Which path will I walk? How do I make this decision? I just don't know. I don't know enough about all this stuff to come to a real conclusion. And ultimately, none of it really matters, because it's just biding time until you get to the final chapter when you finally get the full explanation dump in 15 minute chunks, multiple times, from multiple characters, that actually explains everything properly, at which point all the babble that came before is rendered moot. Despite all the endless micro-revelations about the Skyans, I was never really clear on the lore behind them, and I'm not sure how much of that is due to me not finding it very interesting and thus struggling to retain the information the game was presenting to me, or how much of it was due to the game presenting it in a sloppy and confusing manner. The game starts off by calling the aliens Skyans, and then randomly the term Skyanid gets thrown into the mix, and I don't think it's ever clarified what the distinction between the two is, like if one is a proper noun and the other is an adjective or something else. I think one is meant to describe the humanoid aliens and the other is meant to describe the corrupted creatures, but it took me a while to come to that conclusion because it wasn't explicitly clear to me at first why two different terms are being used seemingly interchangeably. I was also never really clear as to how or why different types of Skyanids were created. 
Dawkins describes the Formers as being places where Skyanids are created, but then Kaya's quest describes a more natural process where regular creatures are corrupted by Dark Elix. So I guess some are created in a laboratory and others are just normal accidents? But then there's another quest with one of the ALB scientists that makes it seem like the other more humanoid looking Skyanids like Deviants are being created through a nesting slash reproductive process by the Brood Devils. At one point Kaya's quest has you finding humanoid Skyan troops that seem to have been created from regular people, but then there are also contaminated people that look like purple zombies and drop Dark Elix when they die, so what's up with them? The glossary makes no mention of Dark Elix and just describes them as being victims of illness from the wastelands of Caracas, like this was a thing that was happening long before the Skyans showed up, so why are they dropping Dark Elix? The glossary also describes a tracker beast as being specifically evolved from wolves, but the intro cutscenes show fully formed tracker beasts teleporting in during the initial invasion. So how did they evolve from wolves before the Skyans and Dark Elix ever made contact with Magalon? To be clear, I'm willing to take some of the blame for not fully understanding this stuff, because frankly I didn't care enough to want to understand it, but some of the evidence makes it seem like the designers themselves weren't exactly sure how all of this worked in the first place. All the while, it takes a really long time for the story to actually get going. That by itself is not unusual in these types of games, since the first chapter, which is usually the longest, is typically more about establishing the world and all of the exposition before the main questline really kicks off in chapter 2, but the story in this game doesn't really start moving until chapter 3, halfway through the game's four chapters. Those first two chapters don't have a very compelling narrative arc to them as they mostly consist of small, incidental tasks that don't really seem all that related to one another and that don't really flow together to give those early chapters a sense of momentum or story progression. The idea is supposed to be that you're gathering forces and building up the sixth power, as well as collecting intelligence on the Skyans themselves and the newfound Dark Elix they brought with them, among other things like trying to find a way to cure Jax's infection, which he sustains in the opening cutscenes, but everything seems to be deliberately disjointed so that it can work with the game's non-linear open world design, where it doesn't really matter what order you do any of these quests. So it often feels like you're just running in place not really moving the story forward because it only ever moves forward in chunks at the end of each chapter once each main umbrella quest, which comprises several smaller subquests for that chapter, is completed. And once it gets into chapter 3, when more significant things start happening and the story starts actually ramping up, it ironically runs out of steam as the scenarios rapidly devolve into endless excuses to have you fight literally hundreds of enemies, 30 or 40 at a time, with barely any kind of narrative context to justify these action sequences, and with the actual story turning into utter nonsense. There comes a time in the story, after you've done all the preliminary stuff to build up the first stage of the sixth power and started to learn more about the aliens, when the proverbial shit hits the fan and all hell breaks loose. The Skyans are starting to attack the human settlements, and for some reason the factions decide that now is the time to start fighting each other instead of focusing on the bigger alien problem that threatens them all, when they've been living in relative peace throughout the entire game and there's been no catalyst to instigate conflict. It's not like in Gothic 1, for example, when the old mine collapses and the old camp suddenly feels compelled to attack the new camp to secure a supply line of magic ore. In that game, there's a solid motive for why the old camp would suddenly attack another camp, and it's instigated by a catastrophic event. In Elix 2, the factions just decide to start fighting each other out of the blue for no apparent reason at the worst possible time. The Albs, for example, are well aware that there are Skyend forces gathering literally right outside their compound, and they're apparently so strapped for people to defend their own depot that they can't spare anyone to go out and fight the Skyends. They send you to go fight them all by yourself, and yet they decide in that moment to send their army of mutants out to attack the other factions instead of using those mutants to help defend their precious depot, or sending them to attack the Skyends elsewhere in an effort to draw their attention away from the depot. And somehow, Jax is psychically aware that this infighting has begun before it's been shown to him or even us as the audience. He just randomly declares earlier in the main questline that he needs to put a stop to the riots among the free people before taking the fight to the aliens in their home territory. Meanwhile, if you go to the faction headquarters and look around or talk to people, there's no apparent sign of any riots happening. It's just business as usual everywhere you go. It's like he read the script and knew the game was going to start spawning quest events soon and then spoke it into existence. There are times even when the actual factions start threatening to attack each other or even consider joining the Skyans, and despite Jax being on friendly terms with every faction's leader, you can't even talk to them to at least say, hey, what's going on, or try to resolve conflicts through diplomatic means. 
You're basically just forced to go around ruthlessly killing all the troublemakers, even the people who are on the verge of siding with the Skyans but who haven't yet actually made the switch which the journal hilariously considers to be uniting the factions, because I guess cold-blooded murder is now considered a noble, heroic way to bring people together. Things get much worse when it comes to exploring the Skyan's backstory, and of course I can't discuss any of this without getting into spoiler territory, so the spoiler-free synopsis of this point is that the Skyans are introduced as a subtle retcon to all of the backstory and lore that was established in Elix 1, with a timeline of events that doesn't make any kind of logical sense to me. With few exceptions, it doesn't directly contradict things we learned in Elix 1, but it's the kind of thing that was conveniently never mentioned in any of the first game's twist revelations, like this was never intended to be part of the series' story when they set out to write the first game. So by the time we get to the end of Elix 2, these new twist revelations seem like they've been pulled out of thin air because they weren't properly set up in the first game. And then if you go back to the first game to double check the continuity, it doesn't really make sense in that context either. Meanwhile, the story has the exact same plot progression as the first game, with it hitting all of the same formulaic beats from beginning to end, except this time with less interesting events and character interactions, and with an ending that leaves us anticlimactically in the same basic situation we were in at the end of the first game. So be warned that the rest of this section will include heavy endgame spoilers. If you want to avoid spoilers, then stop listening here and skip ahead to the next section. The big twist in Elix 2 is that the alien invaders are actually human scientists whom Dawkins had sent into space on board a rocket named Cassandra sometime after the Kalan project failed, with the intent of creating an elixir of life from a strange anomaly he calls the Singularity, which he had apparently discovered and become obsessed with long before anyone even knew about the comet. These scientists supposedly took matter from the Singularity, which would go on to be called Dark Elix by the locals of Magalon, and converted it into what we now know to be Blue Elix as the first step of creating Dawkins' Elixir of Life, and sent it back to Magalon on board the comet, which was already on a collision course for the planet anyway. The scientists spent so much time around the Singularity and working with Dark Elix that they were eventually corrupted by it and evolved into the Skyans who would eventually arrive on Magalon with plans to continue converting the planet into Dark Elix to support their own livelihood. Except, it turns out the Singularity is actually a living organism or something, and it wants back the part of it that the scientists took to create their Blue Elix. So it's now heading for Magalon with plans to presumably extract all Elix from the planet and, once again, for the third game in a row, threaten all life on the planet. The problem with the story is that it completely recontextualizes the original backstory from the first game and effectively changes it altogether. There was never any mention of this singularity or a second rocket after Kalan, and there was no preceding ulterior motive for Dawkins trying to find a way to cheat death. Dawkins was made to seem like a tragic hero who was trying to save humanity from a natural extinction event, and when his plans ultimately failed, he resorted to saving only himself. The fact that he became corrupted and eventually enlightened by Elix was an unfortunate accident that shaped his character arc from a hero to a villain. Now in Elix 2, they've changed that narrative arc by going back and making Dawkins something of a villain from the very beginning, by way of him seeking greater power and eternal life from his own intrinsic desires long before any of this became a necessity to survive a pending extinction event. What was once a lucky accident for him is now portrayed as a convenient excuse for him to continue selfish research he was already planning on doing. And with him sending up the Cassandra rocket to make Elix from the Singularity, it kind of implicates him as being the one responsible for practically every catastrophe that's befallen Magalon over the last two centuries, all because of his selfish desire to empower himself. The timeline of events doesn't even make sense with what we know from Elix 1, or within the context of the sequel's own logic. Dawkins says he didn't tell anyone about the Cassandra project because he didn't want it to suffer the same fate as Kalan, which means Cassandra had to have happened after Kalan, despite the fact that there's a note in Elix 1 which describes Cassandra as being older and that Kalan will bring salvation where Cassandra failed. Kalan was said to be a few years underway before it eventually failed, and Dawkins later tells us that he didn't even discover the comet until five years before its impact, whereas the Singularity is said to be several light years away. So now we're looking at a timeline of about two or three years for Dawkins to create a second rocket, send it light years into space, and send back a sample of Elix on a comet traveling at sublight speeds. 
The physics of such an endeavor shouldn't be possible, except Dawkins says he created a wormhole in space which allowed Cassandra to reach the singularity in time. But if he had the ability to create a wormhole, then why didn't they just send the Elix back through the wormhole? For that matter, why didn't the scientists themselves just come back through the wormhole? Was it only a one-way trip? If so, then how did they get the Elix back to Magalon in a few years' time when the singularity was light years away? Why did Dawkins have to wait 166 years to create another wormhole at the end of Elix 1? And after he created that wormhole, why did it take the Skyan six or more years to arrive? Did they not use the wormhole since we never actually see them going through it? If so, then why didn't they use the wormhole, and why did Dawkins need to create another one at all? And how was Dawkins even able to create a wormhole in the first place? Everything we know about the old world is that it's much like our current society on Earth in terms of technological progress. Dawkins' memoirs even specifically state that they're not a spacefaring civilization who are barely capable of achieving planetary orbit. And yet this guy somehow created a wormhole spanning several light years in space to a specific location of his choosing? Was this only possible because of his research on the singularity? And if so, how did he manage to actually make the wormhole at all? In Helix 2, Dawkins claims that he tried to stop the comet, but if he can just create wormholes in space, then why didn't he make a wormhole to divert the comet? Did he know at that time it was carrying Helix back, which was supposed to be a vital part of his research, and thus want the comet to hit? And if so, how did he know that? In Helix 2, they say the Helix was supposed to be sent back on a harmless carrier rocket, but they messed up the trajectory to the point that it would never reach Magalon, and so they steered it into the comet which would reach the planet. But that was not part of the original plan, so how would Dawkins know about it in that case? Did they send a message ahead of the comet warning him of this change, and if so, how? In Helix 1, Dawkins claims that the comet that destroyed Magalon did not arrive by chance. It was sent to begin the changes to our world, to prepare it for those who follow. But that doesn't line up with how he describes things in Helix 2, because they apparently already knew that the comet was on a collision course before the Cassandra project even launched, and that's not why they put the Helix on the comet in the first place, or the purpose that the Blue Helix was supposed to serve. There are other weird inconsistencies and things that don't make sense to me, like this nonsense with Jax's control chip in Helix 1 and the DNA splicing that Dawkins apparently did to infuse his own DNA in Jax and the implications for what all of this is supposed to mean with Jax and Dawkins being so-called Helix elementals and Dawkins trying to limit Jax's abilities when he was an alb and whatever else. But I don't want to get into any of that because I'm already giving myself a headache just trying to figure out how the stuff with Cassandra is supposed to line up and frankly it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of Elix 2's story anyway. That's where they're trying to set up something for the next game, where Jax is going to have to learn how to become one with the Elix so he can turn Super Saiyan 3 and spend three episodes charging up a spirit bomb to defeat the Singularity or some other ridiculous nonsense. I mean, there's already a scene near the very end of the game where Jax randomly busts out a Kamehameha wave as some kind of Elix superpower, but the game never bothered to establish that either. There had never been any kind of hint that this was even a possibility, and yet all of a sudden he's able to manifest an energy beam and control it during a high-stakes encounter. And it's not depicted as some kind of weird accident, it's like he knew he could do that. But see, if your character is going to develop superpowers, you need to show them discovering their powers and learning how to control them. That's just storytelling 101. Pretty much every superhero origin story goes through that process because it's an essential part of moving the story logically from one point to another. Go web! Fly! In Helix 2, the best we get is a recurring quest from Crony to train Jax's mind so that he doesn't succumb to random blackouts, and then a random offhand comment where Jax claims that he's learning to control the Dark Helix, but we never see him doing anything with this until all of a sudden he's casting energy beams with complete confidence as if he not only knew how to do that, but that he also could do that. Dex is likewise set up to be some kind of wunderkind who's presumably been infused with some kind of special Elix abilities as a result of being the genetic offspring of Jax and Kaya, and as we later learn, also Dawkins. But the game never bothers to explore his abilities either. Wardek, Jax's non-biological father, claims that Dex is special and will play a key role in stopping the Sky Ants, but the most we get exploring this plot thread is vague notions of him being able to hear their voices in his head in one random moment when he seemingly beckoned to one of the Sky Ant formers, as if he has some special connection to it. 
But apart from that, Dex spends the entire game sitting around doing nothing but repeat the same pointless lines of dialogue over and over again, until it's time for him to spring into action in the finale, when he somehow knows exactly how to control the sky and technology and even interface his consciousness with it. There's one throwaway line from Dex about how he learned how to do that stuff while away at whatever faction you sent him to during that quest when you're supposed to be sending him away for his own safety or whatever, but like, how exactly does he learn how to control Sky and technology while staying with the Morcons or the Outlaws who have barely any technology to begin with? Some of the Sky and technology is based on the Old World Infinite Skies tech, so it's plausible that Dex maybe could learn that, but the explanation he gives is glossed over nonsense. The only thing that makes sense to me is if Dex inherited some of Dawkins' knowledge or abilities as a result of Jax being partially infused with Dawkins' DNA, but the game doesn't explore this possibility either. Dex just knows all of this, and we're expected to go along with it with little to no explanation to satisfy the logic of the story. And then he sacrifices himself by entering a Skyend capsule and merging his consciousness with the Skyend computer, and no one, not Dex's caretaker Asgar, nor his own mother Kaya, have any sort of meaningful reaction to this dramatic event until after the main quest is completely resolved, at which point their comments don't make a lot of sense and seem as if they're being played out of order. Dex's sacrifice, by the way, is treated in the story like a tear-jerking moment for Jax, but the game does practically nothing to endear you to Dex personally to make you feel attached to him. We only get two good interactions with him early in the game, and then he spends the entire rest of the game sitting around doing nothing until that moment when he's called to the former, and then at the very end when he's a strange link necessary to hijack the sky and computers. For as important as Dex is to the plot, he really should have been more involved with it. As it is, his sacrifice at the end of the game feels shoehorned and arbitrary, like they were trying to force an emotional story beat without properly building up to it to actually earn that emotional moment. At least when Ray sacrificed himself at the end of Elix 1, we'd had ample opportunity to explore the world with him, to hear his random commentary on things and get to learn his personality, even fulfilling his personal quest and learning about his entire background. I wasn't sad when he sacrificed himself, but I at least appreciated the sentiment behind it, which is infinitely more than I can say about Dex. So much of the storytelling just feels sloppy and poorly thought out. That alone is enough to make the story confusing and therefore unsatisfying when so many things aren't explained properly, don't make sense, or just seem to happen for no established reason, but the whole concept of what they were aiming for is just fundamentally underwhelming to me. At the end of the first game, I was amazed by how the twist recontextualized what I assumed was a natural disaster into a sinister alien plot, and I was looking forward to fighting off an alien invasion force and seeing a new concept for sci-fi aliens and learning more about the true nature of Elix and what it meant to the alien biology, and then basically none of that happened in the sequel. Instead, we find out that the aliens are just goofy-looking humans and that Elix is actually a man-made substance, which is so mundane and lame that it made me lose all interest in the scenario that I thought the first game's ending was setting us up for. And now that we know what happens in Elix 2, it retroactively makes Elix 1's story feel incomplete, so not only does this twist ruin the fun of Elix 2's story, it drags down Elix 1's story with it. It's almost a Ryan Johnson level of subverting expectations for the deliberate purpose of trolling the audience. I could perhaps be alright with taking a different approach and basically retconning certain things if the concept were at least interesting or it led to something exciting, but this whole twist of it was humans and Dawkins all along takes a grand epic sci-fi premise and knocks it back down to Earth almost literally, while the only potentially interesting things like the cosmic horror premise of the singularity being an all-powerful, unfathomable life form heading for Magalon are being reserved for the next sequel. And if Elix 3 follows in Elix 2's footsteps, then the singularity will turn out to be some utterly disappointing thing with a lame backstory that does nothing to satisfy the audience's curiosity or expectations. As you might imagine, the ending doesn't leave me excited for Elix 3 because I don't have high hopes anymore for them to do the premise justice, but also because it's basically just setting us up for the same exact plot scenario where a new extraterrestrial threat is going to arrive and Jax is going to have to find a way to stop it, presumably by uniting the factions for the third consecutive game in a row. By this point, I'm kind of over it, because it seems like the Elix franchise has run out of steam and is just repeating the same note over and over again. In fact, it should be pointed out that Elix 2 has the same basic plot structure as Elix 1. Jack suffers a near-fatal wound and falls off a cliff, thus leaving him severely weakened to start the game. He meets up with a former Alb, who sets him on the main quest to gather forces to fight the enemy threat. He joins a faction to regain some of his lost power. He establishes a centralized base of operations with his group of allies. He goes around the map shutting down enemy towers. 
Jax meets up with his father, who has important information to share. Enemy forces attack the home base to escalate their threat level. There's a twist reveal about Jax's past. Jax meets with an enemy informant. An important NPC betrays him. He gathers his army to attack the main enemy headquarters. A key NPC sacrifices themselves to get Jax into enemy territory. He fights a boss who is planning to bring a greater external threat to the world. And then a strange symbol appears in the sky as a harbinger for a greater alien threat to arrive in the next game. Each game has a few unique distinctions, of course, but they both follow a similar pattern with many of the exact same beats. It was fresh and invigorating delving into this story originally in the first game, but Elix 2 already feels like a watered-down rehash of the same things we've already seen and done before. And if Elix 3 is going to be even more of the same stuff all over again, then I may be inclined to opt out of it entirely. As I previously alluded in the story section, the main questline is pretty lacking when it comes to its narrative presentation, but it's also lacking when it comes to the actual gameplay, in terms of how the scenarios are constructed and what you're expected to do within them. Basically, every single main quest is just a simplistic setup for you to go somewhere to either kill something, fetch something, or talk to someone, and then report back to the quest giver. With little to no narrative contextualization to justify these tasks, and with no deeper mechanical complexity or sense of adventure to make them fun or interesting. The opening quests for Chapter 1 are some of the worst offenders in this regard. One of your very first quests is to kill a group of Morcon Bloodhounds, but the game offers practically zero explanation as to what a Morcon Bloodhound even is, apart from a single line about them being religious fanatics that worship a violent god and showing you a few of their dead corpses. That makes them sound very much like generic, hostile, bandit-like reavers who only exist in the world to give you things to kill in the open world combat system except they're actually members of one of the game's three primary factions, and thus seemingly should have more significant opportunities for role-playing and world-building interactions. Except this quest offers none of that. Your first encounter with the Morcons is treated like a poorly motivated, generic, kill X enemies quest with no lore explanations and no apparent role-playing options for new players to resolve the conflict besides ruthlessly murdering all of them, when it seems like the type of situation that should play out more like your first encounter with the Good Springs Bandits, aka the Powder Gangers in Fallout New Vegas. That's a quest in the very first location where you're expected to make a choice between two opposing sides and then get to use your character's unique stats and skills to influence the outcome. If we look at Elix 1, we can see a similar example from the early gameplay where a berserker sends you to kill a nearby outlaw, but you get multiple dialogue choices with each character and have the opportunity to solve the quest in different ways, depending on your decisions as well as your character's stats. You even get to learn more about the background lore for each faction in the process, so there's meaningful world building happening within this simple quest structure. Whereas a similar introductory quest in Elix 2 is literally just a straightforward kill quest with basically no narrative contextualization, lore exposition, or meaningful role-playing options involved. After that, you get a series of quests to get the Bastion up and running, which will serve as you and your recruited allies' headquarters for the rest of the game, and you accomplish this by killing five annoying critters to secure the premises, as if five piddly little varmints around the outskirts of the Bastion pose any kind of danger to it or its occupants, fetching a hammer for a guy named Gardok, who conveniently happens to live directly under the Bastion and who conveniently is also some kind of experienced engineer, so he can start working on fixing up the fort's structure, as if a single hammer is the only tool he's going to need to do this massive project, and with no future impact of his work affecting anything later in the main quest line, and fetching a small limestone rock that Gardok can use to make some mortar. As if that one rock is going to be enough to get the entire job done, with no indication of him setting up a supply line to gather more, or even where exactly you found it so he knows where to get more. These are perhaps the most banal quests in the entire game, compounded with some of the most utterly nonsensical contextualization, and yet they're some of the very first things you do in the main quest line, which establishes a bad precedent of things to expect later on, and also ensures that your first impressions of the quest design will be poor. Later main quests aren't much better at incorporating meaningful gameplay sequences, as they tend to consist of scenarios like Dawkins needs dark elix samples for his research, so go to a few locations and click on a thing in the environment, then report back, or, the Skyans are hacking the cleric's computer systems, so go to one of their computers and click on it, then report back. Or, we need information from this NPC who's standing around in an easily accessible area, so go talk to them and then report back. Or, Skyan troops are appearing near certain landmarks, so go kill them all and then report back, and so on. 
Even when you're recruiting allies to join the cause against the Sky Ants, they come up with some asinine excuse to force you into a meaningless combat situation that leads nowhere, in which you simply kill a few unrelated enemies who are conveniently nearby and report back to prove you're serious or whatever before they'll help you. It's all just so straightforward and boring that there's little satisfaction to be had from the quest mechanics, because pretty much every single quest is just a reskinned rehash of the same exact gameplay scenarios, which are themselves always a simplistic procedure of, go here, do a thing, report back. Now obviously, video game mechanics are going to be somewhat limited to these basic functions, where most quests will ultimately have to be resolved with your basic toolset of either killing something, fetching something, or talking to someone. But other games, including many of Piranha Bytes' own games, do a better job of elaborating on these mechanics in unique and interesting ways, so that it doesn't feel like you're doing the same repetitive things all the time. There's a similar type of quest that happens in both Gothic 2 and Elix 2, for example, at similar points in the main quest line even, when an important character goes missing and you're supposed to go find them. In each case, the essential gameplay components can be broken down into simply going to a particular location and talking to an NPC, possibly fighting stuff and picking up items in the process. Except there's a stark difference in how each game goes about presenting this type of quest, which makes one of them feel vastly more engaging than the other. In Gothic 2, they create a unique scenario out of this premise where finding the missing person is actually part of the gameplay. You don't know where they went, so you have to ask other people if they've seen anyone run by lately and then follow their leads when they point you in a direction, and then you're literally following a trail of dead bodies from other people who went chasing after him while also running into other new characters who've been added to the scenario to either help or hinder your progress in different ways. All the while, you're running through areas with complex level designs that create interesting pathways and tight choke points where you might encounter other difficult enemies obstructing your path, and branching pathways that might lead you astray if you aren't following your clues well enough. Not to mention a variety of locales with different visual aesthetics and several unique set-piece encounters that you might run into along the way. So even though you've searched for NPCs in remote areas plenty of times previously, it feels unique in this instance because of the way this particular level design integrates with this particular quest, and because of the particular ways in which you're expected to actually track down this particular NPC. Plus, the whole scenario creates a strong sense of adventure with the long journey you're expected to go on through these exotic areas, coupled with the scripted events and progressive stages of getting from the quest's starting point to its end point, such that it never feels like a simplistic, shallow errand quest. To top it all off, the quest resolution also has an exciting twist at the end, complete with an interesting visual event happening, which will have a profound impact on how the story proceeds and what new gameplay scenarios will arise out of this dramatic change of situation. So it all feels meaningful and impactful once all is said and done. Elix 2, in contrast, does nothing to embellish on the simplistic scenario with extra gameplay complications or adventurous elements, leaving you with nothing to latch on to except the most basic mechanics from which the quest, and so many others like it, are comprised. When that important character goes missing in Elix 2, you just toggle their location on the map and teleport slash jetpack straight to the indicated spot and talk to them. That's literally it. There's no deductive reasoning involved with figuring out where to go, and there's no effort involved in navigating the map's terrain or working around various obstacles to reach your destination. There's no adventure, no meaningful gameplay, no creative scenario, no unique events, no progressive stages of development, no anything to distract you from the fact that you're just doing yet another rendition of the same old simplistic, go here, do a thing, report back quest structure which is itself so utterly mindless that it's hard not to just shut your brain down and go into autopilot mode when resolving the quest. And needless to say, it's hard to feel engaged by a quest when its mechanics coerce you into shutting your brain down. The conversation, meanwhile, contributes practically nothing to the overall story, as it mostly amounts to pointless flavor text that doesn't progress anything or introduce new complications to the situation. You just have a short talk about how that person is feeling, and then they go right back to where they were, returning the game to its status quo as if nothing ever happened. So not only are the mechanics completely devoid of interesting engagement, but the story implications are too. There are a few somewhat interesting moments sprinkled throughout Elix 2's main questline, like when you're sent to talk to Theog about how things are going with preparing the sixth power, only to be ambushed by Skyanids, which is exciting and even gives you a little cutscene to set the stage for the attack, or when you have to send Dex away from the Bastion and your dialogue choices influence which of the faction headquarters will go to, which makes your dialogue choices seem like they're having more of an impact on the world besides just shifting your karma meter up or down slightly. But even these limited bright spots prove to be subtly disappointing and underwhelming. 
the attack on the Bastion ultimately boils down to just another generic combat scenario with no lasting consequences, where everyone basically just goes, whew, that was close, we'd better keep our guard up from now on, and then carries on like it's business as usual. And there's no follow-up with Dex to indicate that there was any kind of consequence for your dialogue choices. He just goes to the designated faction and then sits around spouting the same repetitive lines he'd been spouting for the last several dozen hours at the Bastion, regardless of which faction he's gone to and as if he never even left the Bastion at all, until it's time for him to come back to the Bastion near the end of the main quest line. He does give you a slightly different, completely worthless souvenir to reflect which faction you sent him to, but I never found any use for that trinket and his faction selection doesn't impact the final quest in any way, since he gives the same explanation and does the same thing no matter what. The most exciting the main quest ever gets is probably when you're sent to shut down a few of the Sky End formers, which might possibly be your first time venturing deep into Sky End territory or even going inside one. The formers are conceptually reminiscent of the ALB converters from Elix 1 in that they provide a small dungeon-esque environment where you have to fight your way through a series of rooms navigating their layout to reach a control panel near the end of the dungeon. They're a little better than the converters in that they're a little bigger and longer and have varied layouts. They aren't literally the same structure copy-pasted with slightly different room contents like the converters were, but the variety is achieved by way of cookie-cutter assembly of the same basic rooms in different orders with random monsters spawned inside of them. So, much like the converters, once you've gone through one, you'll have basically experienced all there is to see and do in the other formers, which will provide basically the same experience but in a slightly rearranged order of rooms and combinations of enemies. There's a little bit of gameplay involved with navigating your way to the back of the dungeon, but for the most part it's just a single linear path that perhaps occasionally branches into two different rooms or two different paths near the very end. There are no traps or puzzles or complex pathways to make the process of reaching the end of the dungeon unique or engaging, like has been done in previous Piranha Bytes games like Gothic or Risen, and in fact, even the enemies are optional and pose little to no resistance to your progress. In later formers and all subsequent playthroughs, I jetpacked right past all the enemies so I could go straight to the end because there was no incentive and no need for me to slow down to fight these enemies along the way. On the bright side, at least Elix 2 doesn't make you disable all the formers. You only have to disable two of them, the rest are optional, so it doesn't get as tedious or repetitive as in Elix 1 where you had to disable all seven converters at some point or another. So that's a small point I'll give in Elix 2's favor. Things culminate in the third and fourth chapter, from the halfway point of the story to the end, when the quest design devolves into pathetic excuses to have you fight literally hundreds of enemies, 30 to 40 at a time, across a multitude of quests. These scenarios consist entirely of things like, Sky and troop movements have caused wild creatures to retreat closer towards our territory, go kill 30 pathetically weak critters around the perimeter of town, or, Sky Ends have hacked the cleric's robots, go kill 40 of them, or, Sky and troops are amassing outside our headquarters, go kill 30 of them, or, Alb mutants are attacking other factions, go kill 30 of them, or, Sky and Ids are attacking the Berserker's world hearts and Idan, go kill 40 of them, and so on. There's one quest for the clerics, if you've joined them, where they expect you to fight 152 enemies spread out all over the map for one single quest. I repeat, 152 enemies for one quest. If the main quest line until this point could be generously described as uninspired, then this is when it simply become lazy, like they just gave up on even trying to create interesting and worthwhile quests, and instead resorted to pasting hordes of newly spawned enemies across the map for you to kill like it's some kind of mindless MMORPG whose primary goal is to waste your time so you'll keep playing it longer. It's not unusual for games like this to lean more heavily on combat towards the end of their runtime, so the amount of combat isn't so much the problem in and of itself. The problem is that the combat is the sole focus of these quests, with nothing else dressing them up to make them seem like anything more than just simplistic filler content. Chapter 4 of Gothic 2, for example, revolves pretty heavily around combat, but it only officially tasks you with killing the four dragons. All the other combat you get into along the way is mostly optional or serves a complementary role to something else you're trying to accomplish in the quest design. For instance, there's usually some kind of subquest involved with getting into each dragon's territory, each of which involves mandatory combat. However, the quest grants you a unique scenario and special character interactions, so there's more narrative purpose of the combat and more to do in these situations besides killing enemies. Afterward, there are still plenty of challenging enemies along the way to reaching the dragons, but you don't have to stop and fight everything you encounter, though you'll probably want to because it'll make it easier to explore the terrain while you figure out where you have to go, or because it's part of the fun of conquering these unique and interesting level designs, or just because you want the loot and experience those enemies might yield. 
Point being, these enemies are only tangentially part of the main quest, and thus feel more like organic parts of the world that you fight for your own intrinsic desires, not because you're being forced to as part of an arbitrary goal you were told to accomplish. For further evidence of superior combat-heavy quest design, we can look at Ulbricht's big offensive from Elix 1. In that quest, one of the cleric leaders is planning an attack against the Albs, but he needs a better tactician to command the battlefield, which sets you on a preliminary task to recruit Nasty, which involves doing a couple of quests for her before she'll be able or willing to join up. Then once the battle begins, you're treated to some elaborate cutscenes that help to paint the scenario for you in a more epic presentation, and then you get some dialogue options where you have to make meaningful role-playing decisions based on your karma meter, which will impact how the quest plays out in terms of who lives or dies. The actual battle then has a progressive structure to it, with you having to push your way through increasingly difficult encounters as you move across the map, where your allies can die along the way, leaving you with fewer and fewer allies to help in later fights, so there's an element of rising tension with meaningful stakes on the line, depending on your previous role-playing decisions at the start of the quest. So even though the quest ultimately boils down to, go here and kill a crapload of enemies, it's presented in a unique way with extra variables thrown into the mix so that it feels like a more exciting, grandiose event befitting a main quest. The mindless tedium of all these kill X amount of enemies quests in Elix 2 could have been significantly alleviated if Piranha Bytes had taken some cues from these other quests in their previous games and just spiced them up with some more mechanical variety and more things to do within the quest structure. As it is, these quests in the second half of the game are so bad that Elix 2 now dethrones Risen 1 for having the most disappointing second half of any Piranha Bytes game as far as I'm concerned. In fact, it makes me reflect more fondly on Risen 1's repetitive dungeon crawling and copy-pasted Lizardmen battles in retrospect, because at least the dungeons offer some degree of puzzle solving and platforming to mix up the gameplay, and the smaller scale of the world means that you ultimately aren't fighting too many Lizardmen in the grand scheme of things as compared to Elix 2, where there's practically nothing to break up the monotony of fighting vastly higher quantities of enemies in a much bigger map. The finale of Elix 2 proves particularly underwhelming as well. The main questline has two moments near the end where things just awkwardly stop, with nothing for you to do to actively advance the game forward, as you get stuck sitting around waiting for other characters to figure something out off-screen, with no indication of when or how this will be accomplished. You're just left to confusedly wonder, what am I actually supposed to be doing right now? What even can I be doing? I guess I'll just go to sleep for a few days and hopefully something will happen? That's just really bizarre, if not straight up incorrect pacing. Like, the game feels like it should be ramping up to the conclusion where you should be experiencing the most exciting action, but instead of racing towards the finish line, they throw a bunch of random speed bumps at you that force you to slow down and do nothing, for no apparent reason other than to ruin the narrative flow and mechanical pacing of the final chapter. Then the final battle isn't even really a battle. It's just a bunch of small skirmishes spread across the map in pretty much the same fashion as all the preceding Kill X Enemies quests, where you just jetpack to each quest marker, kill all the enemies there, and repeat the process for each site. There's no grand spectacle like there was in Elix 1, for instance, which had all of your recruited allies meet in a unified front to attack the Alb headquarters in a relatively large battle. There are palisades everywhere, all different kinds of allies and enemies fighting all over the place, and even a cinematic camera pan beforehand to emphasize that the scale of this fight was a little bigger than usual. The final battle to get into the enemy territory in Elix 2, in comparison, is just a bunch of normal, mundane fights the likes of which you've already experienced countless dozens of times previously. The final dungeon, meanwhile, is just another former functionally identical to all the preceding formers you've already cleared, with nothing unique along the way to differentiate this final gameplay sequence from anything you've done previously. The Ice Palace in Elix 1 had its share of shortcomings too, compared to previous Piranha Bytes final dungeons, considering that it was just a bunch of long ramps and hallways leading up to the final boss chamber, devoid of any puzzles or combat or navigational roadblocks to overcome, but it was at least visually distinct from everything else that came earlier in the game, and there was worthwhile storytelling happening along the way with NPCs to talk to, journal entries to read, and voiceovers from the hybrid to hear. There are no such redeeming features in Elix 2's final dungeon, so it's ultimately much worse than Elix 1's final dungeon, which was already relatively disappointing to begin with. Next we have Elix 2's companion quests, which might be the most annoying quests in the entire game. You can recruit seven companions to join your cause in the fight against the Sky Ants, with you being able to take them with you on your adventures, one at a time, where they can assist in combat and interject with extra dialogue during certain interactions. 
Each one has their own personal quest line, which I guess is technically optional, but is required to gain their trust for the ending and trigger their endgame slideshow resolutions. And for each one of them, they have you go through pretty much the exact same scenario four or five times with a few slight variations so that you're not literally doing the exact same quest four or five times, but you might as well be. There's a quest line with Naira, for example, wherein you're supposed to be going to different sites to steal strategic plans from each of the five factions to learn more about what they're planning, which you accomplish by grabbing the plans, fighting or run away from the NPCs, and listening to Naira divulge her findings. You do this five different times in a new location with different enemies each time. Crony has a similar questline that tasks you with visiting Sky and Control nodes to learn more about how their technology works, which involves killing everything in the area, walking up to the Control node, and listening to Crony divulge his findings. You do this five different times in a new location with different enemies each time. One of Kaya's questlines follows the same pattern. You're visiting Dark Elix sites where local wildlife has begun transforming into new Skyanids so that she can study the effects and see how it compares to Blue Elix, in which you kill everything in the area, wait for Kaya to meditate, and then listen to her divulge her findings. You do this five different times in a new location with different enemies each time. This quest, by the way, is a straight-up rehash of the exact same questline you already did with her previously in Elix 1 and studying the mysterious nature of the blue Elix in that game. So besides being repetitive within Elix 2, it's also repetitive between games as a whole. The shallow repetition is disappointing enough and caused me to lose all interest in these quests incredibly fast, but the nuisance is made worse by the fact that your companions are constantly pestering you whenever you're in the Bastion to spring more iterative stages of basically the same bullshit quests you've already done multiple times previously. You do one stage of their quest, and then a few days later they're tracking you down and forcing dialogue with you in the Bastion to have you go do it again, and they just keep at it throughout the entire game, with new trigger points happening every few days or at the start of every chapter. And with every new chapter, you get bombarded with a new quest from every single companion, where they're so eager to spring this new quest on you that they even interrupt conversations you're already having with someone else. It seems the clerics have lost control of some of their own troops. I think it's about time to pay the Berserkers a visit. You coming? Or what? It's like something out of a horror movie where they're literally chasing you through the Bastion while you frantically run away, or stalking you while you have your inventory open, waiting for the moment you lower it to ambush you with more quest dialogue. Even outside the Bastion, they interrupt fights that are actively happening to spring unrelated quest prompts at you. We are literally in the middle of a fight, you time? stupid idiot! Mutant sighted near the fort. It's cool that these companion quests have progressive stages that last throughout the entire game, so it's not just a simple one-and-done type of ordeal that you complete in the first chapter, but that appeal quickly dissipates once you realize you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, making these quests feel like yet another instance of time-wasting filler content. It doesn't help matters either that each quest teleports you straight to your destination as soon as you agree to the quest and dialogue, because it's taking you out of the open world gameplay structure and dropping you into what blatantly feels like an artificially created scenario that's been literally separated from the ordinary gameplay by way of the loading screen. If it only happened occasionally, then it probably wouldn't bother me, but it sort of breaks the immersive flow of the gameplay to have it constantly moving you to new locations outside of your control throughout all of these quests. It gets worse when you factor in the recurring side effect of Jax's infection which causes him to randomly become possessed by the Dark Elix or something and sleepwalk to a Sky End form or somewhere, which is the game effectively just teleporting you to a random location at seemingly random intervals, with the chance of that happening any time you complete a quest. This is an interesting idea in theory, because it's trying to show tangible effects that the infection is having on Jax by affecting the gameplay in some manner, instead of just telling us about the infection through dialogue or cutscenes. However, these blackouts are completely harmless and serve no other purpose in the story or main questline except to pose a periodic nuisance to the player by randomly interrupting the flow of what you were doing. So you pick up a companion quest that teleports you to a new location where you complete the objective and then go to turn in the quest, and the game teleports you to yet another location when there were still dialogue options you wanted to select or other areas to explore before leaving that area. Then you have to teleport back to where you just were or find the companion on the map and warp back to them to continue what you were already doing. 
At a certain point, you can start doing mental training exercises with Crony to prevent these blackouts, but this remains a perpetual chore where you periodically have to go back to the Bastion and talk to Crony for a few seconds to prevent the next blackout, and it never develops into a proper quest with an actual resolution, so it's ultimately adding another minor nuisance to prevent an even greater nuisance. The only way these companion quests can be made tolerable is if you enjoy the opportunity to interact with the companions themselves, but I found most of them to be less likable than they were in the first game, and most of the new ones to be generally uninteresting. However, some of these quests are so tedious that I couldn't get on board with them even for the few companions I actually liked, and the few quests that were actually somewhat interesting likewise had some stupidly annoying things going on within them too. Falk's questline, for example, has some fun character interactions where he, as an android, is conducting social experiments to learn how to be more human. The bulk of the questline is just talking to people and witnessing amusingly awkward dialogue. But then his questline falls apart at the very end when the role-playing options don't make any sort of logical sense, and in fact seem to be the exact opposite of what they should be. Fox likewise has some decent character development with learning about his secretive past through his personal questline, but there's a moment when you're sent to search an area for clues about what really happened when he was a child, and against utterly implausible odds you find the exact NPC who was involved with that incident during Fox's childhood, who throughout the entire game had never been in that area previously, at the exact moment you decide to go there looking for answers. That ridiculously convenient timing, combined with the quest marker taking you to the exact spot you need to be, instead of having you actually search a wide area for clues, was just so contrived that I had to roll my eyes in disgust. On the bright side, the companion side commentary seems to be integrated with the other quests better than it was in the first game. Whenever you have a companion with you while working on an unrelated side quest, there's a chance for them to interject with some kind of commentary, which in the first game was almost always just a single line or two of random cutaways that were just kind of awkwardly cut into the middle of the conversation. It didn't always flow very well and felt like an obvious cutaway that was meant to be substituted for any other companion's lines. In Neelix 2, the companion commentary feels built into the conversation more elaborately, like it's actually part of the conversation where the NPC and Jax will respond more thoroughly and the conversation will actually steer into new territory for a brief moment with several back and forth exchanges. So that's one nice improvement they made with the companions over the first game. There are times, however, when they clearly didn't have a line written for that moment and just copy-pasted a line from somewhere else. Oh, Asker. No. Damn it. I knew something like this would happen. What's wrong? Where's my son? He... ran away. Oh, Asker. No. What? It's especially bizarre when they try to cobble together actual dialogue between two characters from lines that were clearly not intended to go together, like when you choose to spend time with your companion. So, any regrets? Guess I'm just usually distracted by your butt. Got its sweetness. Huh. So what do you think? About us? Guess I'm just usually distracted by your butt. Yeah, okay. I can work with that. Forget the Alps. It's really about your ass. I'm bringing the free people together because of your ass. So was that what you wanted? Couldn't be better. Glad to hear it. With pleasure. This small detail is a good example of the game's frustratingly flawed design, because even when they're making general improvements to something, they still sneak in weird oversights like this. You worried? How did we drift so far apart? I'm not worried about that. <laughs> All right then. Good. The one saving grace for Elix 2's quest design is that the faction quests are actually pretty good. In contrast to the other quests that I've described previously, these faction quests do actually have a decent presentation with adventurous scenarios from interesting characters and a surprising amount of reactivity to your actions, which makes them infinitely more fun and engaging than all the main quests and companion quests put together. And since this is how you spend the bulk of your time in the game, exploring the world and doing side quests for each of the five factions in Chapter 1, it's to the game's credit that it does make these quests actually good, since that's where having good quest design would arguably matter most. It's just a shame it had to come at the expense of pretty much every other quest in subsequent chapters, making it seem very much like Piranha Bytes put all of their focus into these faction quests and then ran out of steam for everything else. But while it would be easy and certainly justifiable to praise the faction quest for merely being competent in light of how bad everything else is, there are facets to their design that transcend mere competence and actually prove quite impressive, not just for a Piranha Bytes game but an open world RPG in general. 
chief on the list is how dynamic the game world actually is, with quest scripting and dialogue changing constantly to reflect different circumstances you may have already influenced somewhere else in the world, and with entire scenes unfolding to showcase some of the changes you're having on the world. When you first arrive outside the Berserker headquarters, for instance, you get to see the cultivators tending to the world hearts, which are the mana-infused seedlings that they use to restore plant life to the post-apocalyptic wasteland, and you get to see that the working conditions are far from ideal. Besides everyone vocally complaining about it, you also get to witness their overseer, Thorold, walking around the premises berating her workers and see that they literally work through the night without time to rest. The one guy you find catching a nap even warns you that he doesn't want to get caught napping. At first, you might not even notice this is happening and just assume it's bad NPC scheduling on the part of the developers, but it's actually an important part of the world building which will be influenced by future quest events. Eventually, after doing a series of quests for their overseer, the workers go on strike and Thorold is forced to tend the world hearts all on her own, which the game actually depicts, and then you get the choice to negotiate for improved working conditions in order to get them working again. If you do, Thorold will start actually treating them better, they'll talk about how much better things are now, and they'll actually go to sleep at night. It's all relatively minor, but this questline shows multiple dynamic events and then permanently alters the state of the world, albeit in a mostly cosmetic manner once all is said and done. And the best part is, you're not just told about these outcomes through dialogue, it's shown through the NPC's ambient behaviors and scheduling. For further evidence of dynamic quest reactions, we can look inside the Berserker Fort, where a questline for the Thieves' Guild, known as the Claws, triggers new ambient dialogue around town among generic NPCs with each item you steal, eventually culminating with a new scene of the Berserker leader Rat getting fed up with the situation and sending his guards out to investigate the thefts, where you can actually follow them around town and witness their investigation unfold. Another quest tasks you with checking in on the Iron Mine, where you discover that the miner struck a toxic gas vein that killed the entire crew. After following up with Scrappy, the foreman, you get to witness him assembling a new team equipped with gas masks as they head out to the mine to get it operational again. It's actually surprising how many little scenes like this play out in the open world after you complete a quest. They're technically scripted to sit there waiting for you to walk into earshot before the scene actually plays out, but there's no extraneous UI element that calls your attention to it or tells you to go back to certain areas to see these new events. Like how Elix One randomly and inexplicably popped a message on screen telling you that something happened at the domed city and that you should go back to check things out. So it all feels like an organic part of the world that's realistically reacting to the changing circumstances around it, almost without regard for your specific presence, like the world is carrying on in your stead well after you finish the actual quest. The actual quests also do a surprisingly good job of adapting the dialogue and events within them to match the state of things you've done or haven't done elsewhere in the world. One of the introductory quests for the Alba faction, for example, tasks you with helping a spy infiltrate the Berserker's ranks, who's hanging around outside the city struggling to find a way for the gate guards to let him pass. The dialogue with him is actually different depending on whether you've already been inside the city or not, and the quest objectives change slightly with potential extra steps to complete if you haven't. Likewise, once you get inside the city, there's different dialogue to reflect whether Jax already knows who's in charge and who to talk to about finding work for the Alb spy, or him saying he doesn't know and that he needs to go investigate the area some more. An even better example happens with Ivan, a Morcon trader doing business inside the Berserker Fort. He sets you on a quest to help get Chloe, the local bartender, to hold up her end of a deal he'd made previously for her to trade him some foodstuffs to take back to the Morcon's grotto, and then eventually you get the opportunity to have him escort you all the way to the grotto if you desire. When you first approach him, he asks you to take a look at his inventory, and later in the conversation his dialogue changes to reflect whether or not you've actually looked at his inventory to that point. You never did get around to it. <sighs> You'll need the details. Of course, if you'd like to take another look at my wares, you're welcome to do so. Any sale would help me out. Anything at all. There's also an extra bit of dialogue you can trigger when learning about his backstory if you've already been to the grotto and spoken with Tangus about him, and likewise there's extra dialogue when Ivan is discussing how to get past Chloe's bouncer if you've already been inside the bar and dealt with the bouncer. Chloe then gives you a subquest to resolve matters for her in the Upper District, which triggers extra dialogue and new sub-objectives to get into the Upper District if you haven't already gained access there, which of course plays out differently if you've already unlocked that area. What? Since when? Since I made sure of it. It's about damn time. Then I'll straighten it out right now. Then, once you've gotten the supplies back to Ivan and set out with him for the grotto, there's a moment when he worries about being hassled by the guards on the way out. If you'd previously done other side quests for other NPCs to put up flyers around town, then a guard will in fact stop you to charge you with a fine for doing so. If you hadn't, then you get to leave without incident, and Ivan remarks on your good fortunes. 
During the journey, some of the dialogue between Jax and Ivan will continue to change depending on where you've already been in the world, which NPCs you've already met, and which faction you've joined, and so on. Now it should be noted that these types of reactive changes, both to the quest scripting and the world itself, have been done in previous Piranha Bytes games and in other games in general, so it's not like this kind of stuff is uniquely special to Elix 2. However, the degree to which it applies on this game is exceptional, as I feel like Piranha Bytes put a lot of consideration into how things might play out differently depending on your actions, and made a deliberate effort to affect as many dynamic elements into the quest design as was realistically possible. As a cumulative effect of these efforts, the faction quests feel cohesively tied into the world design and the rest of the gameplay systems overall in a way that you don't often find in these types of games, which I find admirable in concept and satisfying in execution. It helps, too, that the faction quests bother to create unique gameplay scenarios, tell engaging stories, or else have you dealing with more interesting characters and subject matters so that they feel like fun little adventures and not just tedious busywork. The introductory quest for the Albs is a whole multi-step endeavor that begins with an escort quest to bring an NPC from the Outlaw Crater back to the Albs Depot, with a few events that occur along the way, which then leads to a surprise explosion that takes out part of the Albs Elix supply. From there, the quest turns into an investigation to find out who's behind the attack, where you're actually expected to search environments looking for clues on your own instead of just mindlessly following GPS markers on the map, and with multiple recurring characters who may have some type of involvement with what's going on, where your reactions to their behavior can potentially influence the direction of your conversations and your own internalized perspective of the investigation. You also get to travel to other locations with special events that pop up along the way, like a surprise visit from the Skyans and a difficult detour through a tunnel system where you might have to fight or negotiate your way past hostile bandits, with several more surprise twists occurring along the way to completing the quest. It's one of the best quests in the game, maybe of any Piranha Bytes game for that matter, just with the way the scenario unfolds to create a narrative arc with interesting and engaging things happening at every step of the way. Not all of the faction quests are as elaborate as this one, of course, but most of them have something interesting going on to hold your attention even when the mechanics aren't necessarily that sophisticated. Like when you're conducting the Berserker's investigation into the outlaw flyers being put up around town, where you have to question suspects and go on patrol at night looking for suspicious activity, with a final choice once you've solved the case to expose the culprits or work with them against the Berserkers. Or when you're participating in the Morcon Arena, which involves getting it up and running by working with Venya and then learning about Attila's past, with a surprise twist near the end whose outcome will be determined by how you treated Attila. The core mechanics of these quests are ultimately pretty simple and straightforward. I mean, the arena quest could be easily boiled down to fetch a couple items and kill a bunch of enemies, but the contextual framing of searching for clues at night and battling in a monster arena are both unique scenarios that you don't encounter elsewhere in the game, and both of them provide you with some decently worthwhile character interactions and small narrative arcs to lend more significant meaning to the simplistic mechanics. But even in spite of these simple mechanics, they still manage to emphasize player choice along the way, with each quest having a radically different outcome depending on your decisions. In fact, that's another prevailing aspect in which the faction quests shine, as many of them involve some degree of conflict between two opposing sides, like when you get to choose whether to let an outlaw imposter take the place of Tylus's new assistant or ensure the real assistant makes his way to Tylus, or when you get to choose whether to work with Ivika in concealing the true owner of the amulet or expose them to Zarina, or else grant varying levels of success or failure, with different outcomes for the NPCs depending on your choices, like when going on the hunting trip with Vlad, which is meant to subtly test your knowledge of and adherence to the Morcon values, where too many inconsistencies can temporarily bar you from admission to their faction until you make it up to them, or with the aforementioned quest with escorting Ivan back to the Morcon Grotto, where your decisions along the way determine whether Ivan and his wife live, die, or leave the grotto altogether. I don't think there's as much emphasis on using your character stats and karma meter to influence the outcome of quests in Elix 2 as compared to Elix 1, but there's still a lot of important decision making in the sequel, which makes it feel like you're having a significant impact on the world and some degree of control over the situations you encounter, even if some of the outcomes are relatively minor or otherwise superficial. So the faction quests turned out to be a pleasant surprise in this regard, being strong enough all on their own to make the first chapter of the game as enjoyable, if not more so, as doing similar quests in Elix 1. But make no mistake, they're not strong enough to make up for the complete dearth of enjoyment that comes from doing the utterly mindless main quest line, which is persistently bad from start to finish, or the dreadfully tedious and repetitive companion quests, which are basically the only side quests that get added to the game in later chapters. So while the faction quests definitely stand out as being worthy of praise and earn the game some goodwill early on, that goodwill wears out very quickly once you get into Chapter 2 and beyond, thus leaving the quest design feeling lacking overall due to how poorly balanced Piranha Bytes' efforts were in this department.
Elix 1 introduced an unprecedented amount of role-playing mechanics for a Piranha Bytes game, with the expanded functionality of skill checks and dialogue that reflected the entire skill system, as opposed to just one or two specific persuasion-type abilities like Silver Tongue or Intimidate in Risen 2, as well as the all-new Karma system, called the Cold Meter, that measured your character's emotional responses over the course of the full game. These are both welcome additions that added extra breadth and depth to the role-playing mechanics of that game, with a wider range of dialogue options to better reflect your character's unique skill sets and more lasting consequences for how you chose to respond in dialogue or complete quests. Elix 2 retains both of these systems, however, each one has been modified slightly in a way that makes them far less interesting or effective in the sequel. I always liked how Elix 1 sorted the different types of skills into categories and then checked the sum total of points you'd invested into those categories when trying to perform skill checks and dialogue. It was a novel way of translating functional gameplay skills, which ordinarily relate to combat or other things outside of dialogue, into more conceptual representations of your character's overall knowledge of a particular subject, which you could then apply in dialogue. For instance, you may have invested four skill points into assorted crafting skills, which allow you to modify weapons, craft jewelry, open locks, and hack computer terminals, the combined knowledge of which might give your character enough technical know-how to devise a technical solution to a problem an NPC might be facing, which you wouldn't be privy to doing if you'd put those four points into some other set of skills, like boosting your health, stamina, and healing gained from consuming food, which would instead give your character enough survival know-how to suggest you might need more healing potions to survive when dealing with a different situation with a different NPC. In Elix 2, skill checks have been replaced with attribute checks, which ostensibly fulfill the same role as skill checks in allowing you to select unique options and dialogue that reflect your character's unique statistical configuration, except it doesn't have the same effect of tying practical gameplay systems to the character's theoretical understanding of things. The attributes themselves are sort of an abstract concept to begin with, and they don't exactly represent your character's learned abilities and expertise in certain fields. There's merit in checking your attributes to resolve tests and dialogue, of course, but that's more of a generic concept that isn't as interesting to me as Elix 1 skill checks, so it's a situation where I feel the role-playing would have benefited from keeping the old skill check system and then adding attribute checks on top of it. So I'm not entirely sure why they decided to do away with that system altogether. The real fault of the attribute checks, however, is that the game hardly uses them at all. Not that Elix 1 had a preponderance of skill checks either, but attribute checks are almost non-existent in the sequel, to the point that I was surprised any time one showed up because they were so infrequent that I kept forgetting they even existed. I think I only experienced one in my first 10 hours, and then maybe only 5 or so in the next 40 hours, while doing tons of quests for the Morcons, Berserkers, and Outlaws. And in the few occasions when an opportunity to check an attribute actually came up during that time, it was usually only for intelligence and nothing else. One of the very few occasions when the game actually checks against multiple attributes happens during a quest for the Albs where you're trying to get approval for one of their scientists to conduct an expedition to study the Skyans. I liked that one because it was a rare opportunity when it felt like my character build was actually influencing my ability to resolve the quest, since I only had enough strength to convince Azok to go through with the expedition, and I had to do so by saying I was strong enough to handle it all by myself, which meant I got no reinforcements from any other Albs for that expedition. But apart from maybe one or two others like that, the attribute checks were too infrequent and too inconsequential to feel like they played much of a significant impact on the role-playing, which is certainly a shame for a supposed role-playing game. On the other side of the coin, the cold meter was another novel concept in Elix 1, since it didn't function like a typical karma meter in other games, which typically measure your actions as being some variation of either good or bad. Instead, the cold meter simply kept track of how emotional you were, which is more of a neutral gray area on the spectrum of good and bad, since emotional responses can be equally good or bad. An emotional response could mean showing compassion for someone who's suffering, a morally good option, but it could also mean getting pissed off at someone and threatening to kill them, a morally bad option. Likewise, cold options aren't necessarily bad or evil choices. In fact, they're sometimes smart and practical choices that might do the most good in the given situation, like focusing on the matter at hand instead of getting offended and seeking petty revenge, or making the correct tactical decision to commit forces who might get killed defending an objective of utmost importance. So there was a lot of room for interpretation as to what the supposed best choice might be in a given situation, which added extra depth and complexity to decisions besides just picking strictly warm or cold dialogue options. Besides that, it also served a purpose in the story by representing Jax's separation from the Alb Collective and his former dependence on Elix, with the player having the choice to embrace his newfound humanity or relapse back into his old, cold-hearted ways. 
Helix 2 replaces the cold meter with a destruction meter, which is basically the same thing, complete with the same display bug that occasionally shows your karma level as the opposite of what it actually is, except it now measures how creative or destructive you are. I'm assuming this change is because a majority of players leaned towards warm or neutral playstyles in Elix 1, and thus Piranha Bytes decided to make that canon, in which case it wouldn't make sense for Jax to be able to go cold again in the sequel, so they came up with a different system that would work under that pretense a little better. I'm not really sure how creation and destruction are supposed to tie into the story or narrative themes this time around, however. Like, if it's supposed to be Jax creating new opportunities in his life or destroying old ties, or if it's somehow supposed to be related to the Skyans and Dark Elix who are creating new life and destroying old life. You're not exactly given choices about any of that, however, despite what some of Jax's monologues might suggest. Is the path the Skyans are on the right one? Could it be that striving for immortality, for the next rung on the evolutionary ladder, is really the way forward. Which path will I walk? How do I make this decision? Ultimately, you have to work against the Skyans and you have to embrace your relationship with Dex, and thus your implicit relationship with Kaya, even if you choose not to officially romance her again. So Jax's destruction doesn't really tie into the story at all. In Elix 1, your cumulative cold level at the end of the game determined which of the three endings you unlocked, which determined the fate of the hybrid and how Magalon would prepare for the eventual arrival of the alien threats, complete with different cutscenes and dialogue sequences with a final boss to illustrate these different outcomes. In Elix 2, you get the same ending regardless of your destruction level, with the only difference being the types of enemies that populate the world map for the epilogue. But by that point, it's too little too late to really matter since the game is effectively over, and there's no real indication that these differences will actually matter come Elix 3. I presume this singular story ending was done so that Piranha Bytes wouldn't write themselves into the same type of problem they experienced going from Elix 1 to Elix 2, with having to retcon certain endings by making only one of them canon, or else spending entirely too much time and resources accounting for three different starting points in a possible Elix 3. But it's a clear example of the developer walking back innovative progress for the sake of their own convenience. Your destruction level still impacts certain individual options in other quests, in terms of your destruction being high or low enough to pass certain checks in certain situations, but with it having no practical effect on the outcome of the main story, it ends up feeling far less meaningful and impactful than the cold meter did in Elix 1. So in effect, the destruction system seems like an arbitrary change to a more generic karma meter, whose purpose is simply to measure how good or bad you are, since seemingly every single choice boils down to a binary dichotomy of being kind, compassionate, considerate, and polite for creative choices, or being rude, offensive, violent, and greedy for destructive choices. As such, the most sophisticated the role-playing typically gets is be a decent human being or be an a-hole, which aren't particularly satisfying choices. It's entirely straightforward and robs the core role-playing system of any meaningful nuance, since there are no moral gray areas where a morally bad choice might yield a positive shift on your karma meter and vice versa. And since the dialogue window telegraphs every creative or destructive choice by always placing the creative option on top and the destructive option on the bottom, with a neutral choice, if there is one, sandwiched in between, the karma shifts are always the same every time, so it becomes painfully obvious which option you should pick to maintain a particular destruction level. I suppose that latter issue is actually a blessing in disguise, because the logic for what determines a creative or destructive choice is sometimes so vague that you wouldn't be able to make informed decisions if it weren't for their positioning in the window. There are numerous occasions when the dialogue choices seem to be so utterly benign and inconsequential that you would never think to attribute any creative or destructive qualities to them, like how telling Kaya to be careful when dealing with Dark Elix or how asking Fox if he's sure about something are both considered destructive for seemingly no reason other than the fact that they're in the bottom slot of the dialogue window, or how asking a harmless question about the situation when someone asks you to walk around them is considered creative because it's in the upper slot and not the obviously rude response below. It. I guess you could technically argue in that case that you're creating character interaction and quest opportunities by placating the child, but that clearly is not a response befitting a creative dialogue choice, and instead feels like a neutral one that's had creation points arbitrarily assigned to it because they neglected to write in a proper third response option. So if not for the dialogue option's predictable positioning in the window, I feel like you'd often be confused and frustrated by how the game interprets those dialogue options and applies the karma shifts to your character. There's still plenty of confusion and frustration to be had in the system, however, seeing as the game's definitions of creation and destruction are pretty questionable in general. 
At one point, you encounter a wandering NPC who tries to extort money from you, and your only options are to just roll over and let him commit highway robbery, which greatly lowers your destruction, or flatly tell him, no, I'm not giving you anything, which greatly increases your destruction. And for the life of me, I can't fathom why either of these is considered creative or destructive. You shouldn't be rewarded with positive points for appeasing a criminal thug. It's not like you're donating to charity out of the kindness of your heart to assist those in need, and you shouldn't be penalized for standing up for yourself when someone is clearly threatening to attack you. I mean, the supposed destruction option isn't even aggressive about provoking conflict or insulting the guy. Jax literally just tells him to go ask someone else instead. Sure, one of them avoids a fight and the other leads to it, so that must be what the karma shifts are reflecting, but the means of how you get to those end results, on the one hand abetting a clear bad guy, and on the other defending yourself from criminal extortion, seem fundamentally incongruous with those karma shifts that get applied to your character after the fact. And as another frustrating side note, if you choose to pay the guy and then attack him afterwards, you can't take your money back from his inventory because it apparently vanishes from the game entirely. If this were any of the original Gothic games, that would have been a viable option. Falk's personal questline likewise has a weird conclusion where the karma shifts don't make any kind of logical sense to me. The whole point of his questline is that he's an android conducting social experiments to learn how to become more human, which eventually culminates with him leaving the Bastion to join a group of thieving, murderous bandits in order to learn more about the bad side of being human. By that point in my original playthrough, I had joined the Morcons and gone full destruction mode, and suddenly found my character preaching to Falk against my will about how it's wrong to commit such evil deeds when, per my character's destruction meter and faction selection, he should be encouraging that kind of behavior, not denouncing it. So that was a jarring role-playing disconnect between my character and this quest right off the bat, which I didn't appreciate. It's evil, Falk. It's human. You said so yourself. If there is an error in my thinking, please explain it to me. In the end, you're given a few options about how to resolve Falk's situation. The destructive option is to murder Falk because you don't like that he's doing destructive things, and the initial creative option leads to either permanently terminating your relationship with Falk or murdering the bandits to keep Falk around, all of which seems pretty hypocritical and nonsensical to me. If we're condemning destructive behavior as evil, then why is the solution to commit further destructive behavior? Why does the supposed creative option involve destroying a friendship that's persisted through two entire games instead of finding a more, well, creative way to preserve the friendship and correct the behavioral problem? Why does getting Falk to stop his supposedly evil deeds involve murdering other people in cold blood? I know they're bandits, but still, if Jax is going to self-righteously grandstand about how murder is evil and wrong, then committing more murder shouldn't be the answer. In fact, companion interactions are so wildly inconsistent that they rarely make any kind of sense to me. The companions are supposed to have a set of affinity parameters for specific types of behaviors that they like and dislike. For instance, Kaya seems to like creative options and dislike destructive ones, while Nasty is the opposite. Fox likes it when you make jokes, and Naira likes it when you take things seriously. Most companions like it when you do things to help their designated faction and dislike it when you do things to help opposing factions, and so on but those parameters often contradict each other or don't mesh with the rest of their behavior or else aren't considered in the context of the actual dialogue given by the companions. There's one interaction in the crater where a kid steals money from you and you have to chase him through town before finally catching him. Eventually, you can get him to return your money or let him keep it, but then he asks for some food, and Nasty straight up tells you to give him some food so you can get out of there without wasting any more time, and then absolutely does not like it when you give him food, because she's programmed to dislike creative dialogue options, and the designers didn't pay attention to what she said in the directly preceding prompt. Another quest in the crater deals with helping a merchant stop someone from scamming protection money out of her, and for some reason Nasty doesn't like that you agree to help her, because it's technically considered a good deed, even though it's a quest where you're getting paid to beat someone up, which should be right up her alley on both fronts, and even though you negotiated for higher pay beforehand instead of agreeing to do it for free out of the kindness of your heart. Kaya also doesn't like it when you complete that quest, even though it's technically a good deed that grants you creation points, I guess because it's a quest done in favor of the outlaws whom she doesn't like. When completing a quest for Johannes to hang recruiting flyers for the clerics around other factions, he offers to give you his blessing. 
Naira makes a thinly veiled critique about the blessing being a bunch of quack nonsense, but then doesn't like it when you turn down his offer to receive the blessing. Or rather, doesn't like that you're completing a quest for the clerics, even when you chose dialogue options that match her own perception of the clerics' religion, as indicated by her previous line of dialogue. Bully is introduced as the Duke's muscle, a typical sort of enforcer whose job is to rough up people who interfere with the Duke. Your very first interaction with him is him literally picking a fight with you because he doesn't like the way you look, and then once he becomes your companion, he doesn't like it when you start fights with other NPCs, even though that's exactly how his character was established, because I guess he doesn't like it when you pick destructive dialogue options, even when it means beating up berserkers whom he supposedly doesn't like. I could go on with countless other examples, but suffice it to say, it was a constant headache trying to understand how the companions would react to things because the logic guiding their behavior was constantly undermined by contradictions and weird exceptions. It became a tedious metagaming nightmare trying to keep everyone happy, with constant trial and error saves coming to figure out how any given character would react in any given situation and constantly feeling flustered by things not making any kind of logical sense. Now obviously, people aren't logically consistent in real life, and context matters when it comes to how people handle similar but different situations. But in the case of Elix 2, it doesn't feel like a realistic depiction of character flaws or complex social situations, but instead just feels like bad game design. The one bit of praise I can give to the destruction meter is that it's nice how gameplay actions will actually affect your destruction level, like how killing innocent creatures or starting fights, and even killing people, will increase your destruction level, when the cold system was only ever affected during dialogue, with things like murdering people in cold blood just to steal their possessions not being reflected in your karma meter in Elix 1. That's a minor thing though, and isn't nearly enough to make up for how disappointing the destruction system and other role-playing systems are overall. Piranha Bytes games have always had a strong emphasis on a zero-to-hero progression curve that makes the early gameplay extremely difficult in order to make the player feel challenged, while also giving a stronger feeling of purpose and urgency to the leveling system. Every time you level up is meant to feel impactful because it is necessary to improve your stats and skills to advance through the ranks of the game world, with the ever-present threat of something stronger just around the corner to keep you motivated to continue leveling up so you can continue to conquer the open world design. Eventually, you'd reach a point near the end when the grueling difficulty of the early gameplay paid off and you got to feel the satisfaction of having reached the top of the power curve, where you'd become the strongest thing in the game and could obliterate all the enemies that used to give you a hard time or that were once impossible to face earlier on. This concept was taken to an extreme in Elix 1, where you would get destroyed by all but the weakest variants of the weakest creatures at level 1, and couldn't realistically begin to fight even basic enemies until you'd leveled up several times and invested several points into improving your combat skills and acquired better gear. This proved to be a controversial decision that may have actually been a primary factor in Elix 1's middling review scores, as I'm sure many people deemed the brutally harsh upfront difficulty to be unfair and unsatisfying which, combined with the game's clunky responsiveness and idiosyncratic combat system, may have made the difficulty seem outright broken to some people. In what might be a direct response to that criticism, Piranha Byte seems to have lessened the difficulty curve of Elix 2, presumably with the intention of making the early stages of the game easier so as not to drive away so many prospective players like they did with Elix 1. Compared to Elix 1, the starting areas of Elix 2 are populated by a far higher prevalence of weaker enemies, so you're far less likely to wander into extremely difficult enemies you're not meant to fight at that point, and you're also provided with an abundance of healing potions to discover as you explore so that you have ample opportunity to heal in the middle of a fight. Consequently, you spend a lot less time getting killed in the early stages of Elix 2. I'm not thrilled about this change personally, because I'm someone who enjoys Piranha Bytes' typically steep upfront difficulty. I, for example, was elated in the first game when the very first enemy I encountered outside of the tutorial area was a skull-level enemy who killed me in one shot, because I knew at that moment that I was in for a challenge and that it would be immensely satisfying to reach the point when I could come back and get revenge on that reaver. But I have to admit there's some merit in lowering the initial difficulty in Elix 2. For one, it makes smart business sense not to alienate a portion of your audience right off the bat, so that's completely understandable, but I think it also has the benefit of allowing you to experiment with the combat system and get a feel for how everything works better when you actually have the opportunity to survive a fight for more than one hit. 
I would theorize that it's easier to process information and understand the consequences for poor inputs and bad decisions when you have a chance to react to it in real time versus dying instantly and having to sit through a loading screen and then reinitiate the fight to try adapting your technique based on what happened 20 seconds ago in what might now be a slightly different situation. So besides simply making the difficulty easier, it also makes the learning curve easier, which in turn makes getting into the game easier. It's probably also a good thing in allowing the player more freedom to go off exploring on your own right from the start, which is meant to be the supposed draw of an open world game. In contrast to how Elix 1 basically forced you to go to the first town and do quests there to level up a bunch of times before you could safely explore the map. With that being said, I played Elix 2 on the hardest difficulty on my first playthrough and still found the early gameplay relatively easy. For starters, it felt like it took forever before I ran into an enemy that was simply too difficult for me to face, since every enemy I encountered seemed like it was specifically intended to be beaten by a level 1 character the first time you see it, and I was constantly drowning in healing potions because I was finding them practically everywhere. Then, once I recruited Kaya to join me, I was able to handle skull-level enemies with relative ease by letting her tank hits and trigger her fire dots from a safe distance. So for the first dozen or so hours, it was rare that I ever felt seriously challenged beyond my capabilities. That's not to say I didn't have some struggles. I certainly pushed myself too hard trying to defeat the alien trackers that you're clearly intended to run away from as per the opening cutscenes. But apart from a few small exceptions like that, it felt a lot easier than I've come to expect from Piranha Bytes games, even among their recent games that I likewise played on their hardest difficulty settings. As such, I just didn't get anywhere near the same level of satisfaction from leveling up and reaching a point when I was able to overcome previously impossible enemies as I typically do in other Piranha Bytes games. That stunted feeling of progression extends well beyond the early stages, however, and indeed persists throughout the entire game due to the fact that they've decided to implement level scaling systems for certain types of enemies. Yes, there are now level scaling enemies in a Piranha Bytes game, the very notion of which is like a fundamental contradiction to the definition of Piranha Bytes game. Many quest enemies and seemingly all humanoid enemies, including ordinary NPCs, hostile bandits, and even sky and warriors, scale and level with you so that as you get stronger, they get stronger too. This can be observed quite easily by comparing known NPCs' health values at different player levels, with the same NPC having multiple times as many health bars when you're near end game versus when you're just starting out. I was also able to confirm this by visiting a previously undiscovered bandit camp at different levels, with the same bandit enemies in the same location having vastly higher health and presumably higher damage values when discovering them for the first time at a higher level. I observed the same thing in a different situation, this time with a scripted encounter complete with dialogue interactions when I was attacked by a group of highwaymen, who appeared to have much higher health values when discovering them at a high level versus discovering them at a low level. The problem with this, obviously, is that it doesn't allow you to feel like you're actually getting stronger when so many enemies in the game, including the main enemy forces, are getting stronger with you. I distinctly remember one instance when I was pretty high level with all of the best equipment in the game and had just stolen a basic, ordinary looking NPC's weapon, who then proceeded to destroy me in one hit while using a broken iron bar, the weakest weapon in the game, which got subbed in to replace his stolen weapon. Now granted, I was playing as a Morcon and had my health capped at 40%, and I didn't have my helmet on, so I didn't have my maximum armor value equipped while playing on the hardest difficulty, but still. I feel like at that point of the game I should have easily outclassed that type of enemy, especially having stolen his weapon, and that they shouldn't have posed any kind of serious threat to me, regardless of whatever difficulty level I was playing on. I mean, by a similar point in the early gothic games, I would have been able to tank several hits from advanced guards using competent weaponry while I was wearing only mid-grade armor, and would become nearly unstoppable against those same type of enemies by the end. If Gothic 1 had Elix 2's level scaling, the old camp would absolutely curb stomp you when you went back to get revenge on them in Chapter 6, the whole point of which is to allow you to feel like a badass late in the game by vanquishing these foes that used to knock you around and hassle you when you were low level and weak. You don't really get that same feeling or even opportunity in Elix 2 when every humanoid enemy is leveling up with you. This problem is accentuated by the fact that the enemies seem to scale based on your overall character level, which doesn't correlate directly with your actual combat strength after a certain point. 
Somewhere around midway through the game, if not earlier, you'll have acquired all of the best gear and learned all the best combat skills, at which point you'll have peaked in combat strength and run out of ways to continue improving your combat prowess, apart from making incredibly minor improvements to your damage and health by increasing attributes. But you'll still continue to level up throughout the remainder of the game, meaning the scaling enemies will start outpacing your own progression and just get harder and harder over the second half of the game. Now, generally speaking, you want enemies to get tougher over the back half of the game, because that's what pushes the player to get stronger and instills rising tension towards the climax. And you also don't want your main antagonist forces to become pushovers too early in the game, because they need to pose a serious threat up until the end. Level scaling these enemies ostensibly solves both of these issues, but the execution in Elix 2 is poorly balanced against the player's own progression, effectively nullifying your own feeling of progression in the process. And frankly, it makes the second half of the game exceedingly tedious dealing with so many insanely bloated health bars when the game is already spamming hundreds of quest enemies at you. In this case, the level scaling feels like a cheap crutch inappropriately used to stretch out the difficulty balancing instead of tailoring it more specifically to the world design and character progression system like they did in their earlier games. Gothic 2, for example, didn't need to rely on level scaling to maintain a consistent difficulty level, because they set a wide enough range of enemy difficulties with fixed stats to last the entire game, and periodically introduced new enemy types in later chapters to keep the difficulty level up as you advanced in level and through the main quest line. Granted, Gothic 2 is quite a bit smaller than Elix 2, so it's probably easier to balance with fixed enemy stats, but that might just go to show that Elix 2 is too big for its own good if it's having to sacrifice one of Piranha Bytes' core design elements to supposedly balance the difficulty progression across such a vast world. As for the actual character progression, it too suffers from not adequately matching the game's total length. A full playthrough can take 80 hours or more to explore everywhere and experience all the content there is to offer, but you can effectively finish your character progression by learning all of the relevant skills for your primary faction and playstyle in Chapter 1, before even starting the main quest line. If you're someone who likes to take their time exploring the world a little bit and checking out each of the factions before joining one, you can easily reach a point where you can learn every single faction ability the moment you actually commit to joining one, before even finishing all the content in Chapter 1, while also being a sufficient level to achieve their highest rank as soon as you join. In my case, I wasn't even trying to max out my character before joining a faction. I deliberately only did about half the faction quests and ignored a ton of exploration, and was shocked that I could learn every single Morcon skill as soon as I joined, and that I was still only a few levels shy of qualifying for their highest rank. It seems to me like the level requirements to achieve a higher rank should be higher than they are, or else it should be tied to chapter progression like it was in the original Gothic games, and that some of the skills should likewise require a certain rank to unlock. Sort of like how stronger magic spells in Gothic were tied to higher circles that you could only learn later in the game, so that you can't just blitz everything all at once and be immediately done with faction progression. As it is, there's effectively zero faction progression to experience beyond Chapter 1, which leaves you with nothing to look forward to in future chapters and makes the second half of the game feel incredibly stagnant. To be fair, it was the same way in Elix 1, so this problem isn't unique to Elix 2, but it was a definite flaw in that game and should have been corrected in the sequel, not repeated. There are still plenty of general skills to learn after maximizing your faction, so there's still technically room for character progression, but generally speaking these will be the less useful or more situational skills you didn't already learn before joining a faction, or skills for a secondary or tertiary playstyle that you may not actively use. Many of these skills likewise provide zero gameplay-altering abilities, as they mostly consist of passive statistical modifiers and simply make you better at things you're already capable of doing, like dealing more damage with a certain type of weapon, or increasing your stamina regeneration rate, or granting an extra attribute point per level, and so on. These aren't very exciting abilities, and they don't do much to make the gameplay any more fun as you advance through the game. It's a far cry from the original Gothic and Risen games, for example, whose melee combat skills allowed you to unlock all new animations for longer and faster combos, in addition to special attacks that you could input manually for extra tactical control in a fight. Even Risen 2, which had one of the worst melee combat systems of any Piranha Bytes game, managed to have meaningful progression in its combat system with at least a few special attacks and unlocked abilities. In Elix 2, the melee combat progression is literally just deal more damage and lower the attribute requirements to equip melee weapons for the entire game. Again, it was like this in Elix 1 as well, but that's another thing that should have been addressed in the sequel. 
The combat progression in Gothic and Risen was always some of the most novel aspects of those games, with the way their improved animations and new active abilities made you truly feel like you were actually improving as a fighter. So it's just kind of mind-boggling to see them stray from such a successful and worthwhile concept for two straight games. I mean, I wasn't fond of the static melee combat progression in Elix 1, but I could excuse it given that it was a brand new game series where they were clearly trying to do a lot of different things all at once, especially seeing as they actually went through the effort to give us six entirely different sets of attack animations and special attacks for each different type of melee weapon. A vast improvement over the usual two or three that they had done previously. But now that we're on the second game in the series and they've actually reverted back to only having one universal move set for one-handed weapons and only two for two-handed weapons, in addition to cutting back on the overall variety of weapon types, ammunition types, and firing modes, it seems like now would have been the prime opportunity to expand on the core combat system with progressively upgrading move sets and unlocking new special attacks. As it is, the combat system in Elix 2 remains the exact same from beginning to end, with the sole exception of a few jetpack abilities. The jetpack is one of the few bright spots in Elix 2 where they actually did the proper upgrades that you would actually expect from a sequel. The jetpack in Elix 1 was one of that game's most innovative features, but it was admittedly a little clunky in terms of the physics and your overall control over it, and the fact that you couldn't upgrade it whatsoever felt like an unbelievable, glaring oversight in design. In Elix 2, they improved a lot of that clunkiness by making smoother recovery animations that don't root you to the ground every time you land and by giving you better ability to adjust your positioning in mid-air, but they also added a bunch of newfound functionality with new ways to improve it over the course of your playthrough. For one, you can actually improve your maximum fuel supply by finding fuel tanks during exploration, or else by purchasing them from merchants. It takes 50 fuel tanks to achieve maximum capacity, so because it requires so many, and because they're spread out in all different areas of the map requiring careful exploration and observation to find them, that means it actually takes through the majority of the game to reach the maximum, thereby giving you a steady stream of small, incremental improvements to experience over the entire game, which is something you don't get with the rest of your primary character progression. Besides that, you can also spend skill points to unlock a few extra abilities, like the ability to hover in mid-air and even use your melee weapons while doing so, a mid-air dodge ability, retro rockets to protect yourself from fatal fall damage, and sprint boosters to quickly fly forward instead of just going upward. These abilities help to incorporate the jetpack more in the actual gameplay, since it essentially becomes a new form of fast travel during exploration and they give you more ways to utilize it in combat. Consider that in Elix 1, you had no way to dodge in mid-air except to awkwardly fall a short distance by deactivating the jetpack, and you could only use your melee weapon to perform a single type of downward strike that required you to be at a fairly strict angle and distance from your opponent to work properly, while also using up all of your remaining fuel to do so. Now in Elix 2, you can zip around much more quickly to get in or out of a fight at a moment's notice, you can avoid projectile attacks while hovering in mid-air more readily, and you can execute the flying melee attack from virtually any angle from much greater distances while still having leftover fuel to keep moving afterward. These abilities are all tremendous fun, and they're some of the only general non-faction related abilities that actually change up the gameplay in a meaningful, practical sort of way. Unfortunately, the stat requirements to unlock all of these upgrades are relatively low, as they only require a meager 25 intelligence and no rare components, apart from the individual fuel tanks. So you can start unlocking jetpack abilities in as few as two level ups, and then you'll have enough skill points to learn every single skill, apart from higher levels of retro rockets, which you frankly don't need, by level 5, in a game where you can reach level 60 plus by the end. That, I feel, is just way too early to be able to do all of that, and so as with the faction abilities, I wish the stat requirements were higher, or that they needed some type of special component that you had to get from a quest or that was guarded by high-level enemies, so that you couldn't just rush the abilities all at once at the very start of the game, at least not without an extreme amount of difficulty, so that it could feel like an actual momentous accomplishment to be able to unlock some of those abilities. The other general skills are your standard fare that have been largely carried over from Elix 1 without too many significant change-ups. Most of them are too mundane and basic to warrant any kind of serious evaluation, so I'll focus on just a select few here. The most notable change comes to the crafting system, which has now been streamlined into a far more straightforward and simplistic matter of combining three copies of the same weapon into a single upgraded weapon. I'm not very fond of this change, mainly because it completely devalues crafting materials and makes other skills like animal trophies and ore prospecting much less useful overall, 
but also because it creates this really annoying hoarder's mentality where the game compels you to hold on to every weapon you find until you can collect three at a time to combine into a better version that will often sell for more than the three would have sold for individually. At least there's a practical reward for using the crafting system in that manner, so it's not as nonsensically broken as Risen 2's crafting economy was, but it just seems incredibly shallow to me, like you're playing one of those match 3 puzzle games in your inventory where it automatically sorts the matches together before you even have to look for combinations. It is nice, however, that ammo crafting is now a general skill that you can use for all weapon types, since that actually gives you more flexibility in how to acquire ammunition, seeing as it used to be only specific to outlaw weapons as part of the outlaw faction tree in Elix 1. With that being said, the costs aren't always worth it, since hand grenades and shotgun shells, the two main types of ammo that I used in my initial playthrough, are actually cheaper to buy from the store than it is to craft your own. The same goes for one of the outlaw chems, which requires an insane material cost to buy the crafting components from the store versus just buying the pre-made chem by itself. And since merchant stock replenishes every few days and there's effectively an unlimited amount of money to be earned in the game, there's really no need to use the crafting system to make some of these consumable items anyway. There are also a few types of special plants that specifically say they're used for crafting special items, but they're in fact not used for anything whatsoever, like they just forgot to give them any kind of use in the crafting system. There's also this weird thing of many item types being listed as raw materials, which makes them seem like they can be broken down into base components or used in some way to craft something, but they likewise serve no purpose in the crafting system either. So the crafting system is just kind of a weird letdown all around. Another notable change includes the removal of karma-based skills that rewarded you for maintaining a certain karma level, like we had with the three cold skills in Elix 1. This I can understand, because those skills were awkwardly restrictive in that game, with arbitrary pairing between certain playstyles and role-playing archetypes. In the first game, a cold player would get a bonus to ranged damage, an emotional player would get a bonus to magic, and a balanced player would get a bonus to melee damage, if you took those respective skills and maintained those karma requirements. But what if you wanted to play as an emotional melee fighter, or a balanced ranger, or a cold magician? You simply didn't have those options in Elix 1. You were forced to rigidly conform to those pre-established combinations or miss out on the bonuses altogether. So they weren't exactly perfect in Elix 1, but like many other things in Elix 2, this is a case where I would have liked to have seen those skills fixed in some way to make them more universally beneficial instead of just removing them altogether. Like, what if they made those skills affect your ability to choose creative, destructive, or neutral choices in dialogue, or if they unlocked some sort of special alternative dialogue option that would give you alternative ways to solve quests if you had the skill and your karma meter was within the specified range? Or what if they made it so you got some kind of special power-up bonus to your health or defenses when you consumed raw mana, elix, or dark elix? These are just rough ideas, but the point is I think there were ways to improve these skills and make them more viable, but instead they took the easy way out and just got rid of them. It's also worth mentioning that it's possible to learn and maximize literally every skill except for the ones exclusive to factions you haven't joined in one playthrough, so you can become a master of everything and try every single playstyle in one single playthrough if you so desire. If you were to join the Berserkers or Albs, for instance, the two factions with active magic abilities, then you would have equal opportunity to play as a mage, melee fighter, or ranger, using any and all types of weaponry you so choose. In fact, with the faction progression capping out so quickly, you might even be incentivized to branch out into secondary and tertiary playstyles just for the sake of variety, since that would be the only way to experience something new in the gameplay come later chapters. This, to me, is a huge detriment to the progression system since there's no more needing to make intelligent decisions with limited resources, like skill and attribute points, to maximize your character's efficiency, and there's no feeling of making a specialized build that's meant to, well, specialize in a particular field, which might vary from player to player and even from playthrough to playthrough, thus granting more of a unique experience to that particular playthrough and thus more potential replay value. There's still important decision making with regards to when you learn certain skills, since certain skills will be more effective when learned at certain points of the game, but it still lessens the overall impact of character building decisions when you can just learn everything over the course of the game. The last point I should address is the attribute system, which thankfully has had a couple of major issues corrected. In Elix 1, attributes didn't seem to provide any sort of benefit of their own, despite what their descriptions implied. 
A lot of critical statistical information wasn't even displayed in Elix 1, like your total health of all things, so you couldn't just look up the numbers to verify if there were any actual changes to anything. But even testing things and trying to compare relative values of things like health bars suggested that a huge increase in attributes wasn't yielding any kind of noticeable effect. Now in Elix 2, the attributes provide direct progress to increasing combat-related stats, with increasing your constitution leading to a direct increase in health, increasing your strength leading to a direct increase in melee damage, and so on. This information is even tracked with a handy progress meter so you know when you'll achieve the next bonus, at least until you start using permanent stat potions which count towards your bonus points but confusingly aren't tracked on the progress meter, thus causing the meter to get out of sync. What matters is that every 5 points you put into a stat will yield a bonus of some kind. It's obviously good that they've fixed this issue, as that made an entire dimension of character progression in Elix 1 feel somewhat meaningless when attributes serve no other purpose except as a minimum requirement to learn a new skill, which is what would actually affect your stats. However, this form of stat progression, like the rest of the character progression, slows way down after a certain point, making it progressively less useful the farther you get in the game until it becomes effectively worthless. Your melee damage, for example, increases by factors of tens, almost exponentially, by getting new weaponry, upgrading your weapons, learning new skills, and so on. In my case, my final melee damage was over 40 times what it was at the start, and yet your attribute bonuses only ever increase by a measly 1 point for every 5 strength. When you're dealing 200 points of damage midway through the game's progression, an extra 1 point gained from attribute bonuses is pretty much worthless as it's effectively a 0.5% increase to your total damage. And with attributes costing increasingly more points to level up the higher your attribute gets, that means it takes progressively more and more level ups to achieve that one extra point of damage, so even the rate at which you can unlock those meager bonuses slows down dramatically. In my case, finishing the game with plus 25 melee damage and 433 total damage meant that my bonuses accounted for a mere 5.7% of the total damage, which is better than nothing, but not enough to yield much noticeable effect in practice. This is of course in comparison to the early gothic games where your strength provided a direct 1 to 1 increase to your total damage, often accounting for 50% or more of your total damage depending on the weapon's requirements and damage values as well as your critical hit rate. Those games made increasing your strength much more impactful, since it provided hefty bonuses to damage output, which were still worthwhile to increase late in the game, even when attribute costs started becoming more expensive later on. So in the grand scheme of things, it's hard to say that the attribute bonuses in Elix 2 provide much of a benefit to the player. Maybe so in the very beginning when your stats are so pathetically low that plus one might seem like a more substantial value, but the impact of those bonuses starts rapidly going downhill the moment you start unlocking better gear and then falls off a cliff well before you finish the game. In retrospect, it makes me wonder if this is how Elix 1 was secretly operating the whole time, with the bonuses being so negligible as to have no practical effect. We just didn't have any sort of stat sheet or progress meter to see what was actually supposedly going on. On the bright side, they fixed one of the biggest issues with Knight of the Raven's progression system, which is that attribute points gained from other sources, like permanent stat potions, do not count against your progression in terms of future point costs to increase your attributes. Instead of calculating point costs based on your total values, it goes solely off your base value, which is tracked separately in the attribute window. So unlike in Knight of the Raven, you don't have to tediously metagame the system by saving your permanent stat potions until near the end of your development to get the most bang for your buck. You can use those potions at any time, and they will provide their immediate benefit without hampering your long-term progression. Considering how obnoxious that was in Knight of the Raven, it's an improvement that I wholeheartedly endorse, and which stands out as one of few positive aspects of Elix 2's progression system. It has long been customary in Piranha Bytes games for the player to have to join one of three factions to progress through the story, with each faction providing its own unique combination of skills, equipment, and side quests, not to mention a bit of a unique perspective on the overall story. This trend started with the original Gothic in 2001, and has persisted through most of their games over the last two decades, though there's been relatively little evolution in this system during that span. With Elix 2, they actually tried to innovate by including more than three joinable factions, by allowing you to join more than one faction per playthrough, and by also allowing you to choose not to join a faction at all. These are interesting and worthwhile concepts in theory that should deserve praise, but the practical execution isn't much of a game changer, so they ultimately feel like a missed opportunity. 
It's a novel concept to play a Piranha Bytes game as a true neutral by disavowing any sort of faction allegiance whatsoever, but this isn't reflected in the main questline in a very satisfying way. In fact, it's completely undermined when the main questline forces you to ally with one of the factions in the fight against the Sky Ants, from which point onward you end up having a few of the exact same quests and interactions as if you were part of that faction, which largely defeats the feeling of being factionless. There are a handful of minor branches in later chapters where each faction will go to a slightly different area to fight slightly different enemies or recruit slightly different allies based on that faction's unique circumstances, thus lending the main questline a tiny bit of unique flavor for each faction, but you don't really get those kinds of uniquely defining variations if you're factionless since it just ends up feeling like a hodgepodge of the other faction's branches mixed into one generic combination. Besides not getting a satisfying main quest branch, you also miss out on all of the fun gameplay altering abilities that come with joining a faction, as there are no unique alternative skills that are exclusive to being factionless. You just get the same general skills that every other faction has access to from the beginning of the game. Not to mention, you also get less total content to experience since you miss out on the faction exclusive rank promotion quests. So while the option to play factionless is nice to have, it's not something I was ever clamoring for in a Piranha Bytes game, at least not without having a fully developed alternative skill set and extra sub-quest line for picking the true neutral path. As it is, it feels more like a challenge mode to beat the game without any faction abilities and with inferior factionless armor than a proper alternative option to joining one of the usual factions. I hope you realize you're missing the opportunity to learn new combat skills and gain valuable equipment. So choose your words carefully. You won't be able to change the decision you make. From this point on, you're committed. As for the factions themselves, the advertised five joinable factions is effectively just the normal three options, with two incredibly small sub-factions that you can join afterward to add on to your primary faction with a meager few extra abilities and practically no meaningful faction quests to follow. If you liked the Clerics or Outlaws in Elix 1 and want to play as one again in Elix 2, then you're out of luck because they specifically tell you to join one of the other factions and achieve a certain rank therein as a supposed spy first, before they'll officially allow you to join up. And even then, once you do, they have hardly anything worthwhile to offer in terms of skills. So despite eventually becoming a Cleric or Outlaw and wearing their armor, you still spend the bulk of the game playing as a Berserker, Alb, or Morcon, and will continue to play like one even after joining the Clerics or Outlaws. It's also disappointing that the three factions from Elix 1 are now decidedly less interesting than they were originally. The Clerics and Outlaws have been completely neutered to the point that they may as well not even exist anymore, but what remains of the Clerics is lacking any sort of fun psionic abilities like they had in the first game, including their iconic use of suggestion and dialogue. And the Outlaws no longer have any gameplay with cultivating scrap, and their chems are even more boring than they used to be, except now some of them don't even work properly. The Berserkers used to be medieval fantasy-styled Viking warriors who could specialize in swords, bows, and a variety of magic elements, and now they've become exclusively fire mages who almost look more like outlaws than the old Berserkers, as a result of capturing the fort and assimilating some of the old outlaw culture into their ranks. As a proper main faction, the Berserkers do at least have plenty of fun active abilities, however, which is more than can be said of the outlaws or clerics, so they at least have that going in their favor. Now, I'm not advocating for the old factions to remain the exact same as they were in the first game. Some evolution over the years is to be expected, and it would be pretty boring to essentially replay the same type of game with the exact same skill sets as before. But at the same time, it would be nice for the old factions to bear at least some semblance to how they were originally, both in terms of style and function. That leaves us with the Albs and Morcons as the two new factions. The Albs, of course, were represented in the first game as the bad guys, so it's cool to have the option to play as them in the sequel, but whereas their magic was previously represented as consumable technology, they've now apparently become ice and lightning wizards drawing their power from pure elix, which is thematically appropriate at least, if somewhat incongruous with the established lore of the first game. Then we've got the Morcons, a society of barbaric xenophobes who've apparently been living underground in the subway systems for the last 160 some years and are only just now, in the years between Elix 1 and 2, making their presence known on the surface. Their whole shtick is that they derive power from pain, using rights of combat to enhance their physical prowess in melee combat as they take damage. It's not exactly clear how they get this power. It's suggested to be through religion, but you'd think they'd have to be getting Elix in their system somehow for this to actually work this way, but it's never explained properly as far as I can tell. The Morcon skills are probably the most innovative of the bunch for a Piranha Bytes game, and thus the thing that appealed to me most in my initial playthrough. 
The main idea is that you assign passive buffs that will activate when your health drops below a certain percentage, with the buffs being stronger when activated at lower health values. These buffs consist of things like increased melee damage, movement speed, damage reduction, stamina regeneration, health regeneration, and supposedly attack speed, though this last skill is completely broken and doesn't actually increase your attack speed. You're also given the ability to cap your health at certain values below your maximum to ensure that certain buffs will remain permanently active, and there's also a skill that you can use to inflict damage to yourself to manually lower your health further to reach more activation points. There's some interesting strategy going on with this system, in terms of how much health you're willing to sacrifice in order to receive these buffs, in addition to which buffs you want to place at lower thresholds so they will yield stronger results when activated. For example, you might want to place health regeneration at 90%, so it will activate as soon as you take damage, giving you a slow but steady amount of healing throughout the entire fight. Or you might place it lower at 60% or even 40%, so it will heal you more quickly when you drop to critical values, at the expense of only healing you up until that 40% or 60% mark when it will subsequently shut off. If you're confident in your ability to block or dodge attacks, then you might cap your maximum health at 40% or even 10% and put your melee damage buff in that slot so that you're constantly dealing the maximum possible damage for a sort of glass cannon build. So deciding which buffs to place in what activation order and at what cap you'll set your maximum health to, if at all, offers a decent amount of strategic choice in determining your own preferred setup. All in all, it feels like an evolution of the Outlaw Chems from Elix 1, which I criticized in that game for being entirely passive buffs, so I appreciate the Morcon system here for having that extra dimension of strategic trade-offs. With that being said, it's still a largely passive system, which means it ends up being pretty boring in actual use. Once you figure out your desired configuration, there's no more active gameplay involved and no more reason to fiddle with the system, at which point the melee combat system plays out identically as if you were in another faction, or even factionless, except with a few stats being boosted in the background. Which is certainly more effective, but it's not necessarily more fun. You only get three quasi-active abilities as a Morcon, two of which are two standard buffs for damage and damage reduction that you cast for a limited amount of time, but these are, again, simply passive statistical modifiers with pointlessly identical duration and cooldown times that allow you to keep the buffs active 100% of the time, except with a tedious extra step to cycle through the buff animations before each and every fight, and the third ability being the skill to stab yourself, thus lowering your health which you would of course do to reach a certain activation point before or perhaps even during a fight, but I found this to be a pretty tedious process compared to just capping my health at 40% and keeping the buffs active at all times. Oh, and I guess there's also a fourth skill to remove status effects, which are pretty rare to begin with, except it also removes your buffs in the process, so it's basically worthless too. As the only faction with any sort of melee combat specialization, it seems to me like the Morcons should have had at least some sort of special attacks that you could unlock by joining them. Like what if you could do a supercharged heavy attack or a wide sweeping AoE strike at the cost of spending your own health? Or what if they brought back the combo system from Elix 1 and modified it slightly to say that you're drawing your power from your opponent's blood and gave you different types of specials that you could do depending on how much you've charged the meter? or just anything else, something to make the melee combat more actively engaging as a Morcon. The other two factions are weirdly magic exclusive, with the Berserkers using fire magic like melee fire fists that can even pull enemies towards you, ranged fireballs that can be charged for extra damage, AoE fire waves, and the iconic rain of fire that does constant damage over time in the surrounding area, in addition to other utility spells like mana shields or auras that can block or reflect damage. The Albs, meanwhile, get a combination of ice and lightning magic in the form of melee ice fists that can also do a charged AoE burst, medium-ranged chain lightning that can jump to multiple nearby targets simultaneously, an AoE blizzard spell that causes a short storm around you, and a simple heal spell. Of these two, it really feels like the Albs drew the short stick, as they have significantly fewer abilities overall, which is made more problematic by the fact that the Blizzard spell is basically worthless due to how little damage it does in relation to its cost, while also leaving you incredibly vulnerable to damage yourself, in addition to the fact that the heal spell could be considered superfluous to just using regular old healing potions, meaning they really only have Ice Fist and Chain Lightning as worthwhile spells. Even then, I found the arced curvature of the Ice Fist somewhat difficult to aim properly, as it has a tendency to curve over and around certain types of enemies unless you're standing at a very precise distance and specific elevation where you could hit them with a tip at the end of the arc. 
The Alb spells also come with an idle visual effect that has a tendency to fill up the foreground of the screen and obscure your vision, especially when using the default camera, which adds an extra degree of nuisance and perhaps even physical discomfort in the form of eye strain to the Alb experience, which you don't get when using any of the Berserker's fire magic. Then there's the Alb's limited energy supply, wherein they can only replenish spent energy by harvesting Elix from dead bodies. Unless you play on lower difficulties, it's almost impossible to play as a pure mage as an Alb, because you will often spend more energy killing enemies than you ultimately get back, meaning you'll have to switch to something else, like melee weapons or energy rifles, until you can replenish your energy. Or else you have to periodically go farm energy by scouring the map looking for weaker enemies that you can kill while spending less energy. Berserkers, in contrast, can replenish their mana instantly by resting in a bed or consuming mana potions, so it's much more feasible to play as a pure mage as a berserker. I also find it a little strange how the Albs rely purely on what is effectively elemental magic, even if it's supposed to be representing pure elix energy, when they're supposed to be the technologically advanced faction in light of their fancy sci-fi looking armor, drones, giant mechs, and even manned aircraft which they supposedly had in the first game. It seems to me like their skills should have played up this aspect of technology more, like giving you faction-exclusive bonuses for using energy weapons, like, say, by making energy dots on melee weapons exclusive to ALBs, or by giving you extra firing modes on plasma rifles like we used to have in Elix 1. Maybe they could have taken some inspiration from Elix 1's cleric abilities, like letting you cast a holographic decoy to distract enemies, or drop force field minefields in the area to damage enemies, or call in a remote flyby raider strike, or something else to play up the whole technology aspect. Considering they have so many fewer abilities than the Berserkers and their energy reserves are more limited, it really feels like there should have been these kinds of extra abilities to compensate. As it is, the Alb skill tree just feels lacking to me. The Berserkers were the only faction whose skill tree I'd say I actually enjoyed and that it had plenty of unique gameplay-altering abilities to spice things up. The Fire Fists work better than the Alb's Ice Fist due to the uppercut-style curvature making it hit enemies directly in front of you more consistently, and it's immensely fun using their ranged grab ability to pull enemies closer. Spells like Fire Wave help with crowd control, and the defensive capabilities of things like the Mana Shield make it so you don't feel completely vulnerable while engaging in melee combat in this manner. In a way, melee magic is as effective, if not more so, than the actual melee combat system due to its ability to stagger enemies and hit them a little out of their normal attack range. The ranged fireballs are fairly standard, of course, but have extra versatility by allowing you to do melee attacks, which use the same suboptimal arc as the Alb's Ice Fist when enemies get in close, which is a nice option and a little more fluid than awkwardly switching spells for a moment and then back again. The only real downside is that the fireballs have a sort of auto-targeting system that sometimes goes haywire and locks onto something completely incorrect in the absolute wrong direction. It's not consistent enough to cripple the spell's functionality, but it's random enough to be annoying at times. Reign of Fire deserves special mention because it's so overpowered that it completely breaks the game's difficulty curve. It does so much damage that you can kill Triple Skull Behemoths, the presumed hardest non-boss enemy in the game, on ultra difficulty with a single cast as soon as you unlock the ability, which can be done pretty much as soon as you join the Berserkers. It even kills the final boss in a single cast on ultra difficulty. So with one press of a single button you can kill every enemy in the game with zero effort. And the fact that it works in a wide area means you can use it to wipe out entire groups of high-level enemies just by casting it once and running around the area avoiding enemies. Now to be fair, Reign of Fire has always been overpowered in previous Piranha Bytes games, but it typically required higher training of magic circles to use, which you couldn't accomplish until the later chapters, or else was tied to limited use expensive spell scrolls. In Elix 2, you can unlock Reign of Fire early in Chapter 1 before even exploring the majority of the world, and from there on the whole game becomes a complete and utter joke if you choose to use it. Which, frankly, is extremely tempting considering how much excessive combat against hordes of enemies is forced upon you in later chapters. Those quests are extremely tedious when playing as the other factions when you're forced to engage literally hundreds of enemies one by one due to the lack of effective AoE abilities of the other factions. So per my estimation, the Berserkers are the objectively best faction in the game because they offer the most actively engaging abilities, their skills are the most effective in combat, and Reign of Fire helps to mitigate some of the extreme tedium in chapters 3 and 4. On the bright side of the faction system, Elix 2 does a good job reflecting your faction choice and dialogue. 
In contrast to precedent set by early Piranha Bytes games, Elix 2 allows you to do virtually all faction quests while having already joined another faction, which leads to a lot of unique situations where interactions with NPCs will change slightly to reflect the fact that you're already part of another faction. You can still do all the official membership quests to join another faction, for example, and their leaders will comment on the fact that you're ineligible to join them and will offer a different reward instead, while other characters will make offhand comments about why someone from another faction would be here trying to help them. Other bits of idle chatter can change too, like when discussing your background with NPCs during escort quests. Certain quests and interactions can change entirely, like when Navika acknowledges that you can't help them any further due to your faction allegiance, or how you're able to avoid fighting Albs to retrieve a quest item during one of Fox's companion quests if you're an Alb yourself, or how you can talk the Morcon invasion party out of it if you're a Morcon as well. Although, as a brief side note, it's pretty weird how the main quest treats the Morcons, since they're treated like potential villains who have to be stopped even if you're a member of the Morcons yourself. There's even a bizarre line where Jax joins the Morcons, then soon after Dawkins reminds him that they have to do something about the Morcons, and Jax comments, Right, I almost forgot about those guys. And it's like, uh, buddy, you're wearing their armor right now, how could you possibly forget about the Morcons? On the other hand, if you don't join the Morcons, you're forced to murder their entire raiding party to stop them from advancing on the other factions, but then you just go right back to working with the Morcons and being Victor's lapdog informant immediately afterward like nothing ever happened. Despite those inconsistencies, I'd say the faction dynamics are a little better than they were in the first game. In Elix 1, the faction headquarters were largely self-contained and rarely offered any significant interaction with the other factions and usually when you did have such an opportunity, it was with a disposable group nearby who only existed for the purpose of that one quest, with consequences that didn't extend far enough to impact the goings-on with the other faction. The one area where we actually got interesting faction interaction was in the domed city, but that, too, was a self-contained entity that didn't really connect with the rest of the faction dynamics elsewhere in the world. Still, there isn't a similar type of location in Elix 2 where all or multiple factions are represented in the same space, which is a credit in Elix 1's favor, but I think Elix 2 almost makes up for that with the increased level of interactivity between factions elsewhere and with more depth and overlap between factions in general. In Elix 2, there is a greater prevalence of quests where one faction will send you to another faction's headquarters or else have you seek out members of another faction to complete some goal like collecting bounties for the outlaws or recruiting new members for the clerics. NPCs from other factions will sometimes hang out in another faction's headquarters and initiate an escort quest to return to their own headquarters. There's even a couple of traveling NPCs who show up in every faction HQ, so you get a recurring through-line connection between each and every faction location. Then you've got the whole aspect of different factions spying on each other with groups like the clerics and outlaws wanting you to infiltrate the ranks of another faction, or the albs sending you to help an agent infiltrate the berserkers. Later events in the main questline even cause certain factions to outright attack one another. There's so much overlap that it's virtually impossible to get involved with one faction without somehow also getting involved with another, or at least getting some kind of major exposure to them. Each faction also has multiple paths of progression with conflicting ideologies which can lead you to staying faithful to that faction and achieving their highest rank, or working with another subgroup within that faction and eventually defecting to join another. Doing so is unfortunately not as satisfying as it could have been, since the sub-factions feel so underdeveloped compared to the three primary ones, and certain narrative branches associated with switching allegiances, like seemingly being able to influence the Morcons to pursue the teachings of a more benevolent god, don't really go anywhere, thus making the decision feel somewhat hollow and ineffectual in the end. It is, however, still an interesting evolution on the typical Piranha Bytes formula that I think represents a step in the right direction, even if it wasn't fully realized in Elix 2. The combat system in Elix 2 has been completely overhauled from Elix 1 in an effort to make it more fluid and responsive. That would seem to have been a top priority for the developers, since the oft-maligned, janky combat from the first game was probably a strong contributor to that game's mixed reception. Things like wildly inaccurate hitboxes leading you to take damage when you were seemingly clear of an attack, a physics system that often left you feeling uncomfortably rooted to the ground and unable to move nimbly, the rubber band auto-lock targeting system that would cause you to snap towards enemies and vice versa, giving every attack a variable amount of range, 
animations that didn't flow together very smoothly except in a certain prescribed order, and a combo system that kind of encouraged you to just spam the same attack patterns over and over again for every fight, all contributed to making Elix 1's combat decidedly janky and objectively flawed. There was still redeeming value and some hidden depth to appreciate with that game's combat, and indeed it could become pretty functional once you got the hang of it, but the issues were simply too great to ignore. So for the sequel, they scrapped the entire system and started from scratch. The combat no longer revolves around building a combo meter from simple light and heavy attacks to execute special attacks. In fact, that aspect no longer exists. It's now a more freeform system consisting of a greater variety of attack types that you stream together in any order, limited as usual by your available stamina, which decreases as you perform offensive and defensive maneuvers and replenishes during moments of inactivity. With these changes, it now feels closer to Dark Souls than it does Elix 1, considering it uses most of the same types of attacks, including normal light and heavy attacks, sprinting attacks, rolling attacks, kicks, and parries, with a similar timing feel and flow to how you react to enemy behaviors. Of course, it's nowhere near as deep, robust, or polished as Souls combat, so it doesn't provide the same level of satisfaction or engagement as typical Souls-style combat, but I'd say it's a definite improvement over Elix 1 in terms of how everything feels in practice. To this end, they addressed pretty much every criticism I just laid against Elix 1's combat. The hitboxes seem to be more accurate and conforming to the expected size and shape of the models, meaning you don't get screwed so much by poor visual feedback. Jax feels much more light on his feet, being able to move about more quickly when changing directions, starting and stopping, coming out of different animations, and when landing on the ground, meaning he responds to your inputs more quickly so it's a lot easier to control your movement and positioning during the fight. The rubber band auto lock targeting system seems to have been completely removed, or at least greatly reduced, meaning the attacks have more consistent ranges so it's easier to predict when an attack is likely to hit or not so you don't get surprised so much. The different types of actions flow together more smoothly with more transitional animations so you don't get as much of that awkward, jittery, start and stop type feel like you sometimes got in the first game when trying to do things in a different order or timing than the game intended. And with the removal of the combo system and greater variety of attack inputs, you're given more freedom of choice in how to react to different situations at a moment's notice, meaning you don't necessarily get stuck feeling locked into the same repetitive attack patterns all the time. These changes by themselves would be enough to essentially fix the supposedly broken combat from Elix 1, but the improvements don't stop there. The jetpack never felt like it was fully incorporated into the combat system in Elix 1. In that game, all you could do is shoot ranged weapons while hovering in mid-air, where your only ability to avoid enemy projectiles was to slowly jetpack up and to the side using the normal jetpack function, or disengage it completely and let gravity move you out of the way. There was also the single ability to execute a plunging attack with a melee weapon, which required somewhat finicky precision as it only worked from certain overhead angles and only within a somewhat limited range. And even then, it had a tendency to sometimes bounce off the enemy's head, canceling the attack in the process and wasting all of your jetpack fuel. Now in Elix 2, you can use the jetpack attack from virtually any angle, from longer distances away, and it no longer exhausts all of your remaining fuel, in addition to being able to use your sword while hovering in mid-air and against airborne targets, with a newfound ability to do quick lateral dodges in mid-air. Aerial combat with a melee weapon isn't all that involved, as it mostly amounts to spamming a left click while passively letting the game target enemies in the center of the screen and move you towards them. So it's a bit like going on autopilot, but it is still pretty exciting to be able to launch into the air and go flying towards an enemy to whack it with your sword, and I appreciate that you're not forced to switch to a ranged weapon to deal with ranged enemies. The parry ability has also been given improved functionality, with it now allowing you to knock enemies to the ground after a successful parry and blocking damage on a partial parry, which combine to make it much more useful when done right and far less punishing when done wrong. And shooting a bow now feels more like shooting a bow, since it involves a brief charge time where you focus the shot as if you're pulling back the tension on the bowstring, which was not the case in Elix 1, where shooting a bow just plinked the arrows off as soon as you clicked the mouse, no different from firing any other type of ranged weapon. There's even several interesting new types of enemies to fight in the sequel, which behave completely differently from ones in the first game, like all the different types of flying enemies, or ones that burrow underground and jump out at you in a surprise attack. The result of all these changes is that the combat just feels much more responsive to your inputs, with more consistent mechanics and a bunch of exciting new features that, in retrospect, feel like they should have been part of the first game to begin with. It's probably the one area where the sequel feels like it's actually been sufficiently polished from the first game, as a lot of the clunky jank has been ironed out, leaving us with a combat system that just works a lot better and which feels more satisfying. 
but despite all of these fun new features and quality of life improvements, the combat system overall still leaves a lot to be desired, to the point that it's still disappointing in a way. For starters, it never evolves over the course of your playthrough, because there's still no upgrading movesets or unlocking extra attacks through the character progression system. This was one of the things that made the original Gothic game so novel at the time and which persisted throughout the Risen series, but was sadly absent in Elix 1. I was willing to forgive that in the previous game, since it was a brand new IP and it was a lot bigger than their previous few games, with a whole lot of new mechanics, so it was understandable that they might not have had the time to do something like that. After all, that game already had six different movesets for the different types of melee weapons, which is more than usual for their games, so adding even more to that may have been beyond their capabilities at the time. But with a sequel where they supposedly already had a lot of the creative groundwork laid and were presumably able to carry over a fair amount of assets from the first game, it's hard for me to excuse a lack of upgrading movesets or extra unlockable attacks, especially when they've reduced the total amount of movesets to only three. All one-handed weapons use the same animations, and there are only two different animations for two-handed weapons, so there's less fun mechanical variety to reflect different role-playing decisions in your character build, and the decision space for weapon selection is much shallower now because you no longer have to take the movesets or unique special attacks into consideration. For that matter, there's a whole lot less variety in general. There used to be tons of weapon types to choose from, where you also had the option to choose what type of special effect you could enhance it with, what type of ammunition you'd be firing, and even what type of firing mode you'd use, all of which has been removed in Elix 2. Energy weapons, for example, used to be split between laser and plasma versions, and each one had three different firing modes to use, with laser rifles being single fire, three round burst, or full auto, and plasma rifles firing EMP rounds to do extra damage against robots, AoE plasma balls for crowd control and stagger, and the basic single shot mode. In Elix 2, all of that choice, between two different weapons and six different firing modes, has been reduced to one weapon and one firing mode. Bows have likewise lost their ability to shoot multiple arrows in a wedge pattern or with a special seeker arrow. It used to be that you can choose what type of special effect you'd apply to your weapon, with three unique options for each faction type, and now those options are gone too. Weapons just automatically get one type of extra damage effect applied when they're upgraded to a certain point. It even extends to the faction abilities, with the Berserkers, for instance, previously having something like 18 different spell effects across three different elements and a variety of other utility effects, which have now been trimmed down to essentially six, with four offensive spells for a single element and two utility spells. To be fair, Elix 1 had a pretty horrible balancing between all of its different options, with many of them being straight up better than others, and others being of generally questionable viability. I for one found the AoE stun rounds of the plasma rifle so overpowered that there was never any incentive to use either of the two other firing modes, and likewise it seemed like the energy effect for melee weapons was much more practical than the psi or stasis effects, so I never felt compelled to actually use either of them. The same goes for the cleric's black hole spell, which completely trumped the other five spell effects of their two fist weapons. So in a way, Elix 2 is actually trying to correct for these balancing issues by providing a more streamlined selection of choices. I just don't like the way they went about doing it. To me, the solution should be to fix the things that were underpowered or that didn't work right, or else to provide newer alternative options that would compete with the more effective ones, not to simply get rid of the so-called lesser options and remove that element of choice from the player. Because even if the choices aren't fully balanced, it's still nice to have the option to custom tailor a specific role-playing build to your liking, and the more options you have, the more unique you're able to make your build. Not to mention, it's just fun having choices to play around with, as some people like me enjoy that aspect of experimentation, while others may appreciate finding ways to incorporate unconventional skills in their build. It's also good for replay value, since the more different choices for customization you have, the more differences you can experience in a possible replay. It's a single-player game, after all, so it's not like it needs to have perfect balance. Players can choose whether they want to use an overpowered option without affecting another player's experience, and you can choose to play with supposedly suboptimal choices if you want, just because it looks cool or even for the sake of the challenge. So although they may have had noble intentions, I think their attempts to balance everything is actually a detriment to the overall experience, as it's simply too streamlined in Elix 2. And yet the balance is still not great, seeing as shotguns are so ridiculously overpowered that they trump basically everything in the game except Reign of Fire, which can kill the toughest enemies in the game, even the final boss, with a single cast. 
Heavy weapons greatly hamper your mobility and have somewhat limited or otherwise expensive ammunition while not really doing enough damage to justify their use. Two-handed weapons seem less useful than one-handers because of their stamina cost and slower animation speeds while also perplexingly not being compatible with the jetpack. That's not even to mention the fact that their ability to parry enemy attacks was completely broken for nearly two months after the game launched, before being fixed in a patch. Most of the shields in the game only reduce a portion of the damage you sustain. The best one only negates 80% of damage, whereas most average shields you'll be finding negate 50 or 60%, which makes them practically worthless to me since you can avoid all damage with skillful dodging, and parrying will likewise prevent damage and incapacitate enemies in the process, something you can't do as efficiently with the shield, even when using its bash ability. I should also mention that shields reintroduce an element of awkward clunkiness of the combat that Elix 2 had mostly removed, since there's a weird moment in one of the recovery animations after blocking an attack, where it looks like Jax has returned to his neutral stance and should be ready to accept new inputs, but still has to take another moment to slide his shield slightly more into position, during which he won't perform other actions. That one animation introduces an element of inconsistent timing to how quickly you can react after blocking an attack and leads to somewhat frequent moments where you click to attack or try to dodge or something and find Jack simply standing around not doing what you expected. So that's yet another reason I never bothered with the shield. Oh, and the glitch tutorial windows that keep popping up and don't go away long after you've supposedly completed them. Finally, I have to say that I miss the combo system from Elix 1, in spite of some of its awkward limitations, and wish they could have found a way to keep it around in some fashion, as it was a uniquely defining characteristic that made Elix 1's combat stand out conceptually from the crowd of other open-world action-adventure RPGs. As I said before, its absence combined with the other changes serves to make Elix 2's combat feel less like Elix and more like a generic take on other types of games. The combo meter in Elix 1 worked in practice to add an extra dimension of tension and tactical consideration to the mix, with it compelling you to keep your offenses up to maintain your progress on the gauge without losing it, while also needing to balance that against your ever-decreasing stamina gauge as well as your defensive proclivities to avoid getting killed by leaving yourself too exposed while trying to build the combo meter. It also helped its case in that it required you to time your attacks in rhythm with the animations to build the gauge faster, and even just to maintain the attack animations themselves in some cases. In essence, it just made all of your inputs more consequential and gave you more engaging things to think about or incorporate into a fight. There was even lots of potential for improvement in the sequel, as I'm sure they could have added new skills that increased the rate at which you made progress on the meter, or delayed how quickly you'd start losing progress when not attacking, or that unlocked extra types of attacks that would use different amounts of charge to execute, with more powerful abilities using more charge, effectively turning it into a type of magic meter for special melee attacks. Something like this would have gone a long way to improving the depth, progression, and versatility of Elix 2's combat, and would have been a great addition for the Morcon faction to give them, as the only faction that specializes in melee combat, something a little more actively engaging than their entirely passive buffs. In its absence, fights in Elix 2 can sometimes devolve into mindless left-click spam fests because there's no extra consideration for building a combo gauge and no need to properly time your mouse clicks to maintain a more efficient attacking rhythm. In that regard, it's actually worse than every other Piranha Bytes game except Gothic 3 and Risen 2, which have arguably the worst melee combat systems of any Piranha Bytes game. The actual attack animations, by the way, don't look as elegant as the ones in Elix 1. They flow together with the rest of the combat system better, but there's not as much grace or precision to them, as it now looks like you're just haphazardly flailing a weapon around with repetitive back and forth motions like some kind of crazed lunatic. That's a minor nitpick, of course, and I'd happily take the improved responsiveness of the animations over them looking better. When all is said and done, the combat in Elix 2 is a serviceable improvement over Elix 1 in pure functionality, but it's disappointing how much was removed from Elix 1 to achieve this level of newfound fluidity and responsiveness. Consequently, it lacks the depth and character that would be necessary to make it truly commendable, as it feels like they constructed a pretty good skeleton of a combat system, but then neglected to put any meat on its bones. World design has always been one of Piranha Bytes' greatest strengths, with their worlds being big enough to provide an expansive scale befitting an open-world RPG, and yet small enough to provide actual detail in their level designs, with always lots of rewarding secrets to discover. There's a strong sense of atmosphere and immersion with their worlds that you don't often get with other games, which is part of what makes their game so uniquely engaging. 
I'm sad to say that Elix 2 comes short of their usual mark. It's maybe not their worst world design, but it's definitely one of the more underwhelming ones, especially in comparison to Elix 1. Elix 1 had a lot of diversity in its environments, with each region offering a unique experience, both in terms of gameplay mechanics as well as their visuals. Each region had its own environmental hazards which required different precautions to circumvent, like the poison marshlands of Adan or the frostbitten mountains of Zaykor, while offering a generally different feel in their exploration, like navigating the rocky cliffs and lava flows of Ignadon versus the barren desert wastelands of Tavar. This variety helps to keep the gameplay exciting because there was always something new to experience everywhere you went. Besides that, the environments just looked interesting, with lots of contrasting colors and weird alien-looking features that made the world fun to explore if only just for the sake of simple sightseeing. Most of this fun variety has been stripped down in Elix 2. There's hardly any weird alien flora anywhere, so the world looks more generic in general, and the different biomes, which are still meant to have their own unique look, feel much more muted this time around. Whether you're in Tavar, or Ignadon, or Caracas, or Ateris, everywhere feels kind of samey because everywhere has a similar type of bland, almost desaturated look to it. The main difference being that one is a little more brown, or a little more white, or a little more green than the others. In fact, there's not much color in general, as it feels like the entire game is comprised from the same monotonous color palette with hardly any accenting or contrasting colors. To be fair, I suspect this may have been done intentionally to make the actual interactable plants that you can loot, which do have some kind of distinguishable color, stand out from the environments in a more noticeable way, so that you aren't constantly having to face hug the ground to tell what plants can be picked or not. That may have been a reasonable intention, however, this tiny bit of player convenience comes at the extreme expense of the environmental aesthetics. Take Tavar for example. Everywhere you look is just shades of green and brown, with no blues or reds or purples or yellows anywhere in sight. I mean, there was more color in Tavar back when it was a literal desert than there is now that it's been terraformed into a magic-infused fantasy wilderness. So despite this incredible transformation, it's ironically less visually interesting and therefore less exciting to explore than it was originally. And that's another weird downfall of Elix 2's world design. It copies one of the things I absolutely loved about Gothic 2, which is that it allows you to return to a familiar location from the previous game that's undergone some kind of radical change, except they kind of ruined the execution. The idea, as established in Gothic 2, is to service one's nostalgia for the old environment by recreating it in a new game, but changing it up enough so that it can offer a fresh experience that feels like rediscovering a beloved place for the first time all over again. Gothic 2 absolutely blew my mind when they did this, because I'd spent so much time in the colony of Gothic 1 that it was bittersweet to return there again in the sequel, only to discover it's been completely ravaged by orcs and dragons. And of course, I also enjoyed playing Spot the Difference with how much the old environment had been changed to reflect the new situation. Elix 2 does the same thing with Tavar, which was previously the nuclear wasteland of Elix 1, except now it's been converted into a lush woodland thanks to the Berserkers terraforming. It has the same basic structure and all of the same major landmarks which you may recognize as you go around the map, but the problem is that it's all been changed a little too much to the point that it's almost unrecognizable except when you stumble upon one of those major landmarks. Even then, those landmarks have been recreated with all new assets and aren't quite the same, so they don't feel like you're visiting the actual old locations again. It's more like witnessing a false imitation of the original. There are similar things going on in Ignadon, where I spent the longest time running around the map with the strange feeling of deja vu, until I finally saw some random cliff in the distance and realized, oh hey, this is that one area from Elix 1. Didn't that used to be a lava fall? I feel like it took me way too long to make that realization, and the fact that it hinged on one specific visual I think serves to exemplify how unrecognizable these supposedly familiar locations actually are. You can even visit the old Cleric Headquarters, which has been destroyed by one of the Skyan's formers, except there's literally nothing there to remind you of the fact that this used to be the Cleric's Headquarters. There are no remnants of any buildings, no ruined mechs, no shrine to Kalan, no random notes from major characters, no nothing except that one bridge extending over the canyon, which by itself isn't all that special and is hardly representative of the Cleric's Headquarters. Gothic 2, in comparison, gives you recognizable structures in the old and new camp, and even hides notes, references, and easter eggs for you to find so that it feels like you're actually visiting those old locations again. So this whole concept of revisiting old locations from Elix 1 just feels like a huge missed opportunity because they changed everything so much as to make it practically all new, while not really playing up the nostalgia element sufficiently. Besides that, they've almost completely removed environmental hazards from the world. 
This has a twofold consequence on the world design. For one, it makes exploration less rewarding, since you no longer have so many areas that are ostensibly off limits because they would mean certain death unless you come prepared with the right equipment to withstand those conditions. And secondly, it removes that little bit of extra unique character that used to differentiate the different biomes in Elix 1, since they previously had a matching hazard for their respective theming, like poison in Edan, radiation in Tavar, frost in Zaykor, and heat in Ignadon. Even though they all functioned pretty similarly, it really helped with the immersion and also gave you those extra challenges to try to overcome when it came to exploration, with usually some kind of valuable reward to discover if you could survive long enough to explore those hazardous areas. So without them, the different areas in Elix 2 are less mechanically differentiated, which further contributes to them feeling generally kind of samey. But exploration also becomes more simple and straightforward since there are fewer restrictions on where you can go at any time. I also feel like there's just less interesting stuff to discover in Elix 2 compared to the first game. Elix 1 had a lot of interesting world building going on, since it had to introduce all of the lore and backstory for how this world came to be in its present condition. So throughout Elix 1, there's an ongoing process of learning what society used to be like before the comet, how people reacted to the news of the comet, how survivors attempted to get by after the impact, how the various factions came into existence, and even a few really major secrets as to the true nature of what happened just before and after the comet hit. Pretty much all of this is pieced together through written notes and audio logs that you find during ordinary exploration, many of them told in a recurring fashion across several sources scattered across the map, complete with scenery depicting what life used to be like during some of these situations. This alone was enough to make exploration in Elix 1 richly satisfying to me, just because I wanted to learn more about the world and found the process of putting all the puzzle pieces together as I found each new log extremely engaging. With Elix 2, all of that has already been established, so the only real world building to explore is what happened in the few years between games, mostly dealing with how the factions changed into what they are now, which frankly is far less interesting to me. And even then, it seems like there's a lot less to discover in this department in general, and what little there is isn't very memorable. Years later, I can still remember tons of storylines and details that are conveyed through Elix 1's discoverable logs, and yet having just recently played Elix 2, I can only remember a sparse handful of specific notes, few of which have any significant bearing on the overall plot or world building. There's some interesting stuff going on with notes from old Infinite Skies buildings which shed more light on what was going on with some of Dawkins' research, as told from the perspective of some of his assistants. But the whole nature of these notes are sort of ruined by the later revelations in the main plotline, so they ultimately prove to be not that worthwhile either. It's pretty bizarre, too, that the game includes such major improvements to the jetpack but then features it so little in exploration. It used to be that you could expect to find some kind of loot, even if it was just a simple bag of Alexit, practically any time you thought to use a jetpack to fly up to some higher vantage point. This element of vertical exploration has been severely diminished in Elix 2. More often than not, when you think to search on top of an auspicious looking structure, you'll find absolutely nothing at all. All too often, it actually feels like you've left the intended playing area where the developer just stopped rendering worthwhile assets in the level design, leaving you an empty, blank slate of nothingness to marvel at as your reward for your shrewd determination. It quickly got to a point when I just stopped looking in these kinds of high vantage points, because it was a pretty safe bet it would be a waste of my time since the only reliable places I'd ever find loot up there was in highly telegraphed locations like on top of radio towers or some of the more prominent skyscrapers in Thompson Town. It's strange because you'd think the newfound ability to grapple onto ledges and the variable fuel range would lead to a wider array of possibilities for platforming gameplay challenges, and yet it almost feels like more of an incidental afterthought in the sequel. That's not to say the game is devoid of rewarding exploration. The world is still filled to the brim with hidden areas where you can find some kind of valuable loot and even occasionally fun easter eggs. They're just in more conventional places and not so much in jetpack accessible areas. It seems like everywhere you look and every corner you turn, there's some kind of little nook with a spattering of assorted loot, whether it be potions, ammunition, supplies, money, or what have you. Most of the time, these finds are of relatively little value, and the fact that you find so many of these small caches sort of devalues each individual find a little, but it's still enough to provide a consistent dose of excitement every time you discover one. And there are enough truly worthwhile things to find in these hidden areas, like elix potions, permanent stat potions, fuel canisters, map pieces, and occasionally legendary weapons, that it truly compels you to want to explore everywhere possible to reap the best rewards. I was also surprised by how many seemingly random NPCs and quest events I would stumble into while wandering around the map between major locations. 
It's not a particularly dense world design, however, seeing as there are a fair amount of open spaces with not much to really see or do, and the more prominent areas of exploration feel a little more spread out than usual. I suspect that may have been done to facilitate the sprint boosters by giving you more space on the map to fly around using the jetpack like a form of fast travel. Consider that, if the map were too compact, you'd be constantly flying past everything with the sprint boosters and would rarely get to use them to their full extent because you'd have to stop and slow down all the time. In this case, I'd say the trade-off in density was worth it because the sprint boosters are so fun in general, since they make simply moving around the world much more enjoyable. It's actually kind of painful going back to Elix 1 now and having to run around that map on foot without the benefit of sprint boosters, which just goes to show how much of a welcome addition it is in the sequel. So despite the slightly lower density of content and a few other pitfalls in the overall world design, it's still pretty fun to fly around the map exploring for hidden secrets, and there are enough of them with enough rewarding value that it's actually pretty engaging on your first pass through the map while you're exploring everywhere in Chapter 1. It's just a shame that the environments look so bland and that there's not as much interesting lore to uncover through exploration as compared to the first game. It's not bad by any means. In fact, it may actually be one of Elix 2's stronger aspects, but it seems like there was still plenty of unfulfilled potential with room for improvement, which for those of you keeping score has become something of a recurring theme by this point of the review. On the technical side of things, Elix 2 is a mixed bag of some good, but mostly bad. It's not the colossally broken, unfinished mess that was Gothic 3, but it might be their next worst game in terms of the state in which it was released. And that, frankly, is not what you want to see when it's the game in their entire catalog that they presumably had the most funding for and spent the most amount of time working on. Perhaps being developed during the height of a global pandemic had an adverse effect on their production, in which case some of the rough edges are understandable, but still, some of the issues I'm about to go into are inexcusable, considering their core gameplay mechanics that just straight up didn't work when the game launched, some of which still haven't been fixed roughly two years later. When the game first launched, two-handed melee weapons could not parry enemy attacks. It just did not work, and it took almost two months of patching before it finally got fixed. Two-handed weapons also do not work with a jetpack, and it's unclear if this is an intentional design decision, like if in-world they're supposed to be too heavy for the jetpack, or if it's a missing feature that they just never got around to incorporating. After all, you could do jetpack attacks with two-handed weapons in Elix 1, so it's strange that you can't use them as such in Elix 2. To this day, the Morcon Right of Combat, which claims to increase your attack speed, does no such thing, and the Outlaw Pick Me Up Chem, which claims to trade HP for damage, does neither of those two things. In fact, neither of those two abilities seem to have any discernible effect on anything whatsoever. Numerous other skills give contradictory descriptions of what they do, like the Morcon Right of Stamina, which claims to increase your stamina, but is actually increasing your stamina regeneration rate, or the Berserker Mana Aura, which makes it sound like a constant AoE dot, but is actually a single spike reflect damage buff, or the Backstab skill that makes it sound like a stealth ability by use of its unsuspecting enemies terminology, but it in fact only works on alerted enemies in active combat. There are yet other examples of confusing terminology, like how certain items or abilities will describe critical attacks and special attacks or heavy punch with no explanation of what these actually are. It's especially confusing because things like special attacks and heavy punch were terms used in Elix 1 for mechanics that didn't make the transfer into Elix 2, so it's unclear if these are supposed to be hidden attributes or if they were initially placeholders that eventually got changed to something else but never had the official terminology changed to match the new function. The controls are, or at least were, incredibly inconsistent. In the inventory screen, you can usually just press a number key to assign an item to that slot of the hotbar, but at random times the game won't allow you to do that, even when you clearly match all the requirements, instead forcing you to press F to bring up the quick slot menu. Then at other times, for things like magic, you have to press space to bring up that same menu, so why are there three different inputs for the same thing that sometimes work in some situations, but sometimes don't? In fact, the inventory system in general suffered a huge downgrade by getting rid of tab selections to quickly switch to specific categories by clicking at the top of the screen. Now everything is sorted into one giant list that you have to scroll through every time you want to find something, except the window frequently likes to spaz out and default you back to the top of the list when trying to scroll down. 
When trying to dodge in combat, you can assign a specific dodge button or double tap a directional key, but when the game launched you could not use your assigned dodge button while hovering in mid-air. You had to use the double tap method, so the same input didn't work in different situations. You can long press or double tap the spacebar to activate the jetpack, but since you had to double tap it in Elix 1, that's what I've been conditioned to do. This works fine when moving in most directions, however, if you double tap space while moving backwards, it activates a standard roll dodge instead of the jetpack. The spacebar is typically used for moving upward, whether that be moving or flying upright with a jetpack, but then it's also unintuitively the let go and drop down button when hanging from a ledge. I kept wanting to press down to release my grip, and it was always a bit of a logical jump in my brain to get myself to press space in those situations. And since there's no input to determine when Jax will grab onto a ledge, you're at the mercy of him randomly grabbing onto ledges that you didn't intend. And with space being used for both let go and activate jetpack, it's easy to get stuck in a loop repeatedly grabbing onto the same ledge over and over again. Equipping a shield frequently causes a tutorial window to appear on screen and not go away, even long after you've supposedly completed the tutorial. Sometimes the stamina bar randomly disappears from the screen during combat. Perhaps the worst of all these problems is the camera system due to the sheer physical discomfort it causes. For the first time in over 20 years of Piranha Bytes games were given no control over the camera placement and thus its relative FOV. That might be tolerable if the default FOV were at least somewhat comfortable, but it's uncomfortably narrow at its default setting, and then constantly zooms out and back in every time you change your movement speed, which includes every time you start and stop moving. This becomes especially problematic in densely packed rooms where you're constantly moving around and stopping to loot everything, as you just get hammered by this constant snap zoom effect over which you have no control. It was bad enough that a significant amount of people complained about motion sickness and headaches, causing Piranha Bytes to patch in an alternative camera 10 days later which keeps the camera at a fixed distance. This camera is a massive improvement over the original, but it's still got issues of its own. Namely, the FOV is still more narrow than I'd like it to be, and you still have no control over its zoom or position. It's pretty damning of Piranha Bytes' efforts that a modder was able to release a camera fix before Piranha Bytes could, and that the mod offers way more customization options than either of the official ones. Now, some of this could be considered nitpicky, but sadly, a lot of these extend well beyond simple polish issues that would be understandably hard to notice or correct during preliminary playtesting, and instead point to more serious issues with the quality assurance process between developer Piranha Bytes and publisher THQ Nordic. Like, it is seriously baffling to me that they could work on this game for five whole years and decide that this was the camera system they'd go with for the final release. That seems like the literal very first thing a playtester would have commented on, which suggests to me there was either a complete lack of playtesting or a complete disregard for playtesting feedback. Likewise, when several core gameplay mechanics literally do not work, it begs the question as to how much people were actually paying attention during the development process or how much people cared to actually fix those issues. It really makes it seem like they did not spend their time or money well. Performance optimization is a bit of an issue as well. The game seems to be more demanding than its graphics quality would suggest, so it's difficult to find a good balance between frame rate and high graphics settings even on a computer that meets all of the recommended requirements. Some areas bog down so badly that the frame rate would drop from the 40s and 50s into the low 20s or high teens, with flickering shadows and tons of distracting pop-in effects. I even had a bizarre glitch early on that made it look like my game world was being steadily consumed by a black void, which I believe required me to turn down the ambient occlusion to solve. For the most part, the game was at least playable for me, but it was definitely not smooth or comfortable, as a jittery frame rate coupled with that snap zoom camera was enough to cause me some actual eye strain during longer play sessions. It wasn't until 8 months later that they released a DX12 compatibility mode that my performance and graphics settings became reasonably stable, which of course was way too late to benefit all the loyal customers who'd bought the game when it first released and finished playing long before that patch came out. Graphically speaking, the game looks pretty decent for the most part, except for the bland color palette, of course. There are times even when it manages to look truly beautiful, like during sunsets with the golden light from the sun beaming through the canopy of a forest, or at night around glowing light fixtures. Even just the light from a torch can create incredibly moody shadows and ambiance. There's really good detail on the way water flows from one area to the next, with different currents based on what paths and obstructions the water is working around. It's some of the most realistic looking water that's ever been in one of these games, and I think it looks reasonably impressive even by AAA standards. 
And as I've said elsewhere in the review, the character animations are a massive improvement over how rigid everything was in Elix 1. Just walking around uneven terrain, Jax has a much more natural fluidity to the way he reacts to things as he steps over small ledges, continues the stride of his momentum when dropping down a ledge, reaching out with his arms to brace against walls, and so on. Even the lip syncing seems to be really accurate, with facial animations that allow for bigger, more expressive movements than we're used to seeing in these games. But for every moment like this where I find myself impressed with the visuals, there are many more moments of distraction that actively pull me out of the experience. The faces, for instance, border on uncanny valley territory. It's hard to pin down exactly what it is, but there's a certain soulless quality to the eyes, like the way they forcibly maintain rigid eye contact throughout an entire conversation while never really looking at you, if you know what I mean. And the facial animations themselves have a somewhat robotic quality to the way individual parts of the face move to form a new expression. It's the kind of deal where they're technically superior to the faces of Elix 1, but those ones ironically look better because they aren't trying to do as much complicated stuff, with a little more of a stylized look, and thus don't fall into the uncanny valley. It's weird, because the faces actually don't look bad in low light conditions. It's just once you get out into bright sunlight where they start to look plasticky and unnatural, which is unfortunately how they appear the vast majority of the time. It's also a little disturbing how much of the inside of people's mouths you see, as a camera likes to position itself such that it can see all the way to the back of people's throats with an insane amount of illumination back there. I should also mention that Jax, in particular, looks incredibly different from how he looks in the pre-rendered cutscenes and from how he looked in Elix 1, which they actually show during unedited flashbacks, so it's just really distracting to be presented with three different faces for the main character, all in the same game. The distance graphics used to look really ugly and underwhelming to me when the game first launched, like there was just something wrong with the graphical detail, or the atmospheric filtering, or the volumetric lighting, or the hazy fog effects, I'm not sure what. I'm not an expert on graphics design or even the terminology, but since switching over to DX12 mode I find it doesn't really bother me as much, so I guess they did something along the way to make it less distracting, or maybe something changed in my own perception. But then there's also the fact that so many of the game's trees are in a constant state of blowing in the wind like there's a hurricane rolling through, with some of them flailing around so much they look like the whopping willow from the Harry Potter movies, or like some kind of weird alien creature, or like aquarium seaweed rippling under a jet stream. It only seems to affect certain models of trees. Some trees have a more realistic gentle sway or lean to them, which only goes to make those other ones look incredibly out of place. The music is still being done by Piranha Bytes' own Bjorn Pankratz, but I can't say if it's any better or worse than Elix 1's music. It's kind of the same deal as before, where the music tends to consist of nebulous droning tones with different accenting notes and sparse melodic lines that serve a basic level of functionality in setting a tone for an area, but which never serve to raise the music above that perfunctory level to be anything memorable or special. I've got over 200 hours in Elix 2, and the only tracks I can really call to mind are character themes that carried over from Elix 1, like Rakaia, Nasty, and Falk, and the music for the Berserker headquarters in the fort. I actually really like that track. It's got a musical pattern you can actually follow with a layered instrumentation, and it has a little more engaging motion than other tracks with its string-plucked eighth notes giving this environment a little more of a bubbly liveliness to it. It's one of my favorite tracks from both games. But even saying that, it's still nowhere near as fun or memorable as the music we've had in previous Gothic Arisen games. The other song I can distinctly recall is Dex's theme, albeit for bad reasons, since that track feels like an incoherent mess to me. It's okay when it's just the arpeggiated synth parts with light flute or piano on top of it, but as more stuff gets layered on top, I just lose track of what's going on in the song in terms of time, rhythm, progression, everything, and it just becomes noise to me. And that's a tough pill to swallow when they're trying to endear you to your supposed child with this kind of clunky, discordant music. The biggest issue with the soundtrack isn't actually the music itself, but how it's edited into the game. There are no smooth transitions from one theme to another. Everything is just a hard cut that changes in an instant in the middle of a conversation and even within monologues as the topic of conversation switches hey. from, say, hopeful optimism to foreboding hmm. concern to the subject of Dex. It's like a musical slap to the face every time it happens. Good to see you, Jax. Have you thought about what you want to do next? Skyans. Did you come up with the name? 
The alien invaders gave it to themselves. How did you escape the hybrid's machine? When you defeated that pathetic hybrid form, the logical part of the machine was destroyed. You have to understand, although I still remember much of my time as the hybrid, many of the machine's thoughts and memories were wiped out. But it appears the hybrid opened a wormhole near Magalan not long before its encounter with you. A what? A few more minor nitpicks to point out. The map screen doesn't let you zoom out far enough to actually get a reasonable overview of the map. Even at its most zoomed out, it feels like a zoomed in close up, so you're constantly having to pan around to get a sense of spatial relations for everything. Then there's a lock picking screen, which somehow manages to be the worst it's ever looked and also the least visually functional, despite being their fourth go around with this concept. Everything is just so dark without enough color contrast that it's sometimes difficult to tell which pins are up or down at a passing glance. This is a clear example of just one of many unnecessary changes that didn't need to be done, which bafflingly make the game worse. As the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but Piranha Bytes' mantra for the sequel seems to have been, reinvent everything at any and all possible costs. Like I said earlier, it's not all bad, just mostly bad. There are, in fact, a number of quality of life improvements in Elix 2 which should be commended. The user interface, for example, has a lot of newfound functionality and is generally much more informative than it was in Elix 1. There is now an actual statistics window that you can bring up to see things like your actual health and stamina, which were conspicuously absent in Elix 1, and the attribute screen gives indicators for what bonuses you're receiving and when the costs are going to increase. The destruction meter shows an actual scale so you can gauge your relative destruction levels more accurately, instead of guessing as to what the vague adjective indicators were supposed to mean in Elix 1. On the map screen, you can place tons of custom markers to help remember things in the environment you want to come back to, or to check off areas that you feel you've cleared during exploration, and you can also track much more information from the map screen than ever before, like highlighting specific types of skill trainers so you can find one more easily, or tracking the wandering merchants so they show up on your radar screen. The inventory screen now has a mark as scrap function that you can use to sell all items marked as scrap with a single button from the trade window. Any marked items will continue to carry that mark even after you've sold all in your possession and then acquire more later, so there's much less tedious hassle in selling off all the junk items that serve no other useful purpose. And now there's a very nice click and hold to interact function, which helps to prevent so many accidental misclicks where you inadvertently steal something or get stuck waiting through the long animation for Jax to take a seat or crawl into bed when you were trying to do something else. Perhaps most important of all, the physics and responsiveness for just moving around, which includes using the jetpack, are leaps and bounds better than they were in Elix 1. The first game always felt pretty clunky in this department, but it's become painfully obvious going back now after Elix 2. There's a slight delay to just about every control input, with Jax feeling sluggish to start and stop moving or to change directions, and often coming to a complete halt when dropping down even just a slight ledge. Even just trying to sprint randomly incurs nearly two seconds of delay before he actually starts sprinting. And the jetpack fuel meanwhile feels oh so limited in retrospect, and the incredibly slow recharge rate that you suffer as a penalty for exhausting it past the red line really drags the gameplay to a crawl, especially in conjunction with Jax's inability to grab onto ledges if you come in just short of getting your feet over the ledge. Not to mention the jetpack's somewhat primitive ability to basically only fly straight up, with no other way to really control your movement or positioning in mid-air. In Elix 2, all of this is improved. Jax reacts to your inputs so much faster in every regard, he keeps moving while transitioning from the jetpack to the ground, and you have a lot more specific control over your movement and positioning with the jetpack. Plus, the recharge rate doesn't feel as needlessly punishing, and the ability to expand your fuel capacity as a reward makes the pace of the gameplay actually improve over the course of the game by progressively cutting down on how much time you have to spend waiting for the fuel level to recharge. Even something like sneaking has been improved with the newfound ability to sprint while in stealth mode so you don't feel as horribly sluggish, not to mention the new interface icon which helps to keep you better informed as to how visible you actually are, at least supposedly. I'm not sure it actually works correctly, but at least there was an attempt at increased feedback. Seriously, I cannot stress enough just how much of a difference these changes make to the general feel of the gameplay. The overall responsiveness and improved fluidity of the basic character control of Elix 2 goes a long way towards ironing out a lot of that clunky jank that plagued Elix 1, to the point that it makes Elix 1 feel almost painful and unbearable to go back to. 
It's not enough to make up for all the other shortcomings I've outlined in this section, but it does make the basic gameplay a lot easier to get into. At the end of the day, Elix 2 is a little better than the first game in some ways, and a little worse in others. The increased fluidity and responsiveness of the movement scheme, the more freeform combat system with more types of attack maneuvers, the new jetpack upgrades and abilities, and some of the new UI features like an actual stat page, a more informative attribute screen, custom map markers, the ability to mark items as scrap, and so on, are all tremendous improvements over Elix 1. While other things like the faction quests and exploration are at least as good and sometimes better than they were previously. On the other hand, the role-playing systems are a little shallower, the combat system lost some of its depth and variety while still having the same problem of completely static progression, the world design feels a little bland, and the main questline and story turn into tedious, ridiculous nonsense. Whether you see Elix 2 as a worthwhile follow-up to Elix 1 depends on how much value you place on these different aspects, as there are things to like and dislike in pretty much every department. If you're someone who liked the concepts of Elix 1 but found the actual gameplay too clunky and frustrating to enjoy, then you'll probably really appreciate Elix 2 because of how much smoother the core gameplay mechanics are in practice. But if you're someone who was drawn into Elix 1 because of the hidden depth it had to offer in so many of its design elements and could tolerate a lot of those janky rough edges, then you may find Elix 2 underwhelming due to how much has been streamlined or cut out in order to achieve that smoother, more polished gameplay experience. Judging the game by itself, it seems to me like the pros and cons are fairly evenly balanced, leaving Elix 2 as a somewhat middle-of-the-road experience, where it's really not that good, but by the same token it's not completely terrible either. It's just okay. The first half is fun when you're exploring the world for the first time, getting a taste for the progression system and new mechanics, and doing all of the faction quests in Chapter 1. And then the second half loses a lot of its luster as the game starts to outstay its welcome, both in terms of the quality of its content as well as the depth and variety of its mechanics. Where Elix 2 really suffers is the context of being a sequel, where I think we all had higher hopes than something that was merely just okay. After all, Elix 1 was such a diamond in the rough that it seemed like it should have been a pretty simple and straightforward process to take the gem they already had on their hands and simply cut it into shape a little better and polish it up to achieve its true brilliance. And yet, for some reason, they seemingly decided to reinvent the wheel, if you'll excuse the mixed metaphor, by changing a bunch of things that seemingly didn't need to be changed and making some things worse than they were in the first game, while still missing a ton of crucial improvements that should have been made along the way. This while having the most amount of time they've ever had to develop a game, and I presume the most funding they've ever had, while already having a solid foundation from which to start working. Meanwhile, the game had so many broken mechanics and technical issues at launch, some of which have still never been fixed after several rounds of patching, that I have to seriously question how the time and money was actually spent. By all accounts, the game we got should have been much better than it was, and that's where the real disappointment comes into play. Not so much with the game itself, but with the missed opportunity it represents. It seemed like such a clear path for another Gothic 2 level masterpiece, and yet they found a way to mess it up by meddling with things a little too much and not learning the proper lessons they should have. In the end, we're left with a game that falls somewhere between being decently acceptable for what it is, and ultimately disappointing for what it could have been.